I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Hey, aloha, everybody. Welcome to the interview room. Uh, grateful everybody's here tonight. Man, have we got an amazing program for you. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, we have been doing a little uh, research on some things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that have been floating around in this uh, poor little Summer Wells case. Uh, a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, theories. But as you know, here on the interview room, uh, we like to keep things factual uh, and right uh, to the point without interfering or jeopardizing uh, with the investigations that are ongoing for this little girl. And tonight we've got a treat for you. Uh, first of all, uh, I've got the Director of Dom uh, Domestic Law Enforcement Relationships for the uh, Operation Underground Railroad. And let me tell you, if you're new to uh, this channel, I'm here to tell you, you are in for a real treat. Uh, J.C. Holt, who's going to be with us here in a little bit, uh, is just, he, he is kissing babies and shaking hands, let's say, for this organization uh, that is worldwide, and they are making a difference in human trafficking. In fact, uh, I'm going to play a trailer to a movie that you can go see uh, after this program tonight, it's on Amazon Prime, and boy, it will really uh, help you understand uh, what we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, so real fast, uh, I want to thank everybody from around the world that is here, and I know uh, you folks are around the world. We are so grateful uh, that you trust our channel here, and we are so appreciative of all of our members, all of our subscribers, uh, all of our uh, mods, Miss Sophia, Maui Girl, Mimi J2, uh, J TJ, and of course, Four Sons Mom. We can't do this without you, uh, and we're grateful for your time. If you have not had an opportunity to hit that subscribe button, that's all we ask here in the interview room. And after we get an opportunity to talk to JC, get a perspective of not only human trafficking uh, around the globe, but here in North America. Uh, after he is done, I've got a special guest coming on. Uh, I'm gonna save it, uh, but uh, she will be amazing. Okay. So, uh, Dill, let's uh, tee up this trailer and folks, take a look at this and then we'll jump into getting JC in here. I never dreamed that I would work in Haiti. Um, I didn't know anything really about Haiti until I learned about a little boy who was born in Utah, U.S. citizen, and was kidnapped in Haiti from his church where his father was the pastor. I read about it in the local newspaper. I thought that I could make it into a U.S. case and I, and I couldn't because it wasn't. We had to leave our jobs. I had to leave my job because I just had to do something about it. We went to Haiti to look for his son. Yeah, it's right here, right here, right here. And we never found him. People weren't talking about human trafficking like they are now. And really it's because of the work and efforts by organizations like Operation Underground Railroad. It's a subject that nobody wants to think about or talk about. It's the worst part of humanity. Okay. 
Oh, wow. And yet, we've got to do something about it. Please, get on the ground right now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground right now. Get on the ground. Put that down. on the ground. Every 30 seconds, a child is sold. They're sold for sex. They're sold for labor. They're sold for organ harvesting, which is something we're now getting into. There's six million children that are forced into one of those three categories right now, and the world doesn't know. Not a lot of people know, but the profile for men who travel abroad to have sex with kids are American citizens. The U.S. creates the demand. The highest producer and consumer of child pornography is right here in the United States. Well, if you lost one of your children to one of these evil people, you'd do anything to get even and get, get your child back. I had a knock on my door one day. Tim said, listen, I, I really feel like I can do better leaving the government. I'd find a group of kids in Guatemala or Colombia, and I couldn't do anything about it because it wasn't a U.S. case. It's, it's outside of the jurisdiction, and I understood that. However, that doesn't mean that we couldn't be doing more. Tim Ballard left his law enforcement career, everything that he knew, his pension, his security, to start a nonprofit called Operation Underground Railroad. They've done jumps everywhere throughout the world, rescued kids, and then helped them get to a safe place with their aftercare programs. He had a way that we could really make an impact, but they needed a million dollars to start. And I said, I'm in. We had set up this operation that looked like it went flawless. We unfortunately got some very frustrating news. The traffickers were being released and that all the girls were released. They paid money to the right people, to the judges. The job's not quite done, but it's almost done because now we need to go back and we need to re-arrest every single one of these traffickers. It will be a message to Haiti, to America, to the whole world, that there are good people everywhere that will stand up for this. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce it. Uh, the Director of Law Enforcement Relationships, uh, J.C. Holt, for Operation Underground Railroad. J.C., how are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Man, I'll tell you, just watching that trailer, what, what an amazing, amazing um, situation that you guys have been uh, working. Uh, by the way, did you guys... Uh, get that get the boy i uh, i understand i've heard different things um the boy unfortunately has never been found no that's the that's the sad part of the story uh the 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 thing is is the, the movie's powerful and just the movement that it gives in this space and helping others that are impacted by this is just immeasurable and so while it's a heartbreaking story, there have there have been good things that have come from that, specifically with our organization on just gaining drive and momentum to impact this space in trafficking and exploitation, which is just so rampant right now. Yeah, you know, and knowing a little bit about your personality and Tim's uh, personality, uh, a, a bingo card for a thousand that he's not given up. He's He's on a mission to find that child. Yeah, I mean, our, our organization, definitely, we seek out the one, and whoever that one is, unfortunately, there are thousands. Uh, yeah. But we every, every life matters, every victim matters, every survivor matters, and so there's plenty of work to be done. And uh, we never give up. The company never sleeps. Awesome. Well, uh, first of all, I'm grateful for your time. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. Uh, and, and you're... Uh, just an amazing representative uh, for your um, just the operation as a whole, uh, and and I love the the reason you guys call it the you know Operation Underground Railroad because Operation just represents obviously you know to us former LE that it's just an ongoing situation that does not stop, and you got you guys have some pretty uh, 
high-end folks that come into those as operators uh, that go undercover and buy children uh, globally. So I'm just going to say a little bit about OUR, if that's okay. Of course. From my perspective, yes. and, and keep me honest, number one. You know, but first a little bit about JC. He's retired LE, 20 plus years uh, in the business. And he worked for uh, law enforcement agencies around Salt Lake. He was a parole uh, probation officer as well. He has a wealth of experience in the child uh, sex slavery arena. Uh, and, you know, when Tim and his team selects guys, you know, to be the out front for the organization, uh, you get JC. Uh, he's an amazing human being, and we're just grateful to have him here. So, child sex trafficking, uh, and and keep me honest here, JC refers to recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a minor for the purpose of commercial sex act through force, fraud, coercion. Uh, do not need to be present for the crime to be considered. Your organization is a 501c3, and if folks want to donate to your organization, you're going to see their links down below, and we're going to also put it, uh, our mods will put it into the chat tonight. Um, the world experts in, you guys are the world experts in extraction operations, anti-trafficking efforts to bring uh, an end to child slavery. Uh, tell our audience this evening why this idea that slavery uh, still exists if uh, across the globe. What's your well, thoughts I, on that? And I appreciate you saying that. I certainly wouldn't consider ourselves to be experts by any measure. Uh, we're, we're just folks that are trying to make a difference. I think we offer great perspective into uh, what it looks like in different places of the world. But there are so many other players in this space, too, that are trying. So we don't consider ourselves to be experts. Um, but honestly, the, yes, it, it just that term is very broad and it sound it reminds me of my uh, my law enforcement days of a legal definition. Of course, that that is different in each country. And one thing we know for sure as an international company is that it's different everywhere around the globe and there are different laws and there are different infrastructure types for law enforcement. And that's a tricky system to work within to, to be able to navigate in that space and try, try to work. And so while we work in one region of the country uh, or of the globe, and it might look a certain way, it might look totally different in another region of the country, but the purpose is always the same. And that is uh, to get back to your question regarding the slavery. It, these are folks that we that we believe are enslaved. Uh, they have been led to certain situations under false pretenses that they would receive something else that doesn't come in return. And then they find themselves in a situation where they do not feel free to leave or they are not free to leave. And, and that spectrum is literally all the way across the board. It could be that they they feel they have no other place to go all the way up to the to the fact that we have encountered folks that are literally enslaved and, and held captive to where they're not allowed to leave by force if necessary. Yeah, a fascinating. So your team, I know, includes, uh, you know, obviously former CIA and, and Tim was CIA, right? I mean, he started in the agency. He, he, worked, uh, he did work for a federal agency. It was not the CIA. Um, okay. But he started out in customs. And of course, that agency has, has changed names a few times. Yeah. Uh, I believe right now it falls under Homeland Security. But it was, yeah, he, he, he started. And if you watch that movie, you can get some more history on Tim. He's an amazing man. It's a privilege to work for him. He's very passionate um, and, and is just not the guy that you want looking for you or that has your number in terms of just getting to the end of resolve of task. He's, he's a very determined individual, but he, he started working, uh, he was down on the border, you know, working, working yeah. those cases San Diego. around the border. Yeah. And so and he did have a long law enforcement career of over 10 years. And uh, part of that movie, that the trailer that you just showed, explains the reasons why why he got out. He felt like he could make a bigger impact in, in this space, in this nonprofit space. And 
he has uh, he has led the organization to just awesome things uh, where you know the huge impact has been made in this space and we continue to do so and, and it's a privilege it's a privilege to be here it's a privilege to be part of the work to serve yeah absolutely in fact uh, I met you know John who was his former who was Tim's old boss uh, years ago and doing my career in Southern California you know I uh, when they first you know put the human trafficking uh, teams together through HSI uh, you know, av I think Tim was part of uh, the original group uh, that kicked it off because he went from climbing through tunnels uh, to, you know, going undercover and, and uh, buying kids and that kind of stuff through foreign, uh, in foreign countries. So a uh, question. So you guys lead basically coordinated ID and extra uh, extraction efforts. What exactly is that? You know, I think you're you're speaking regarding what we do in the international space, which really, yep. if I could summarize everything we do as a group in terms of the law enforcement effort, we seek to empower law okay. enforcement through various means. That empowerment does look different in different regions of the world. We have been part of efforts to extract those that we believe to be uh, enslaved in sex trafficking in other countries. And that's always done through that host government. Uh, so it's building cases, it's building information, really uh, serving as the eyes and ears sometimes for these groups to get into places where they might not be able to get into because it would look suspicious for them to be there. Uh, these, these folks that unfortunately are doing this in other countries are often catering to foreign visitors. And so obviously if you're a native to that country and you don't look like the foreign visitor, it's going to be hard to get some of the information that you need to move the case forward. And that's where OUR has had operators go in, usually that have professional backgrounds that support that type of work to go in and get that information and then coordinate and collaborate with that governmental agency to pass that along to build cases against bad guys. I mean, it, when you boil it down, it really does, that's the gist of it. And it's, uh, we're not an organization that has any law enforcement authority. Uh, we're not, we don't do any enforcement. Uh, we don't do any investigation. We don't do any reporting. Uh, we, we come from the angle of supporting empowering and just honestly bringing education and awareness to that is a big piece as well and then what good would any of this work be if we didn't have aftercare support to to survivors that you know Huge. before anybody goes into a country uh to work you know on behalf of this effort our aftercare teams are leading into countries they are leading into countries and making connections so that we have successful uh, plans that we can get in place before we start bringing people to to help otherwise you know you're, you're running in and you're doing all this work and it's great but what about picking up those pieces when we leave so yeah no and I that's a big big piece of obviously what you guys do you have an amazing uh, amazing support mechanism for survivors once they once they've been recovered uh, and you plug them into to your programs, and man, that's a that's a very unique challenge in of itself. And the fact that you guys are on the front end, and then you're kind of in the middle, and now you're at the back end as well. So you really do have a whole solution. So let's get into what the what the trends are and what the problem is. What you guys are seeing, you know, I think there's an estimated based on uh, some numbers that I've looked up. Almost 24.9 million people are trafficked around the world. Now, I was a vice detective from 1984 to 1986, probably before you were born. I'm teasing. No, not quite. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You know me, I'm kidding. Yeah. I, I know, right? But so back in the day, obviously, you know, that was, you know, called a certain thing, right? And I want to be very sensitive here on YouTube, okay? But it seems to have been repackaged into into the adult world, into human trafficking. But I think you would agree, since you know the 
early 2000, you know, 20 and now up to, you know, when Tim kicked this off in 2014, that really was a turning point for children getting into uh, becoming vic uh, victims of this problem. So uh, obviously, you know, I called you and I said, hey, there's a little girl by the name of Summer Wells in Tennessee, Kingsport, Tennessee, who has just evaporated. Okay? There's a lot of speculation, a lot of chatter. Uh, you know, her father has come out and said she just vanished. Her mother said she just vanished. Okay, So I wanted to approach the theory on whether or not it, this is a you know, it could be something better or bigger than what we really realize. And and I have my own opinions in relationship to the victimology uh, from a criminal behavioral analysis aspect as to, you know, whether or not this is a, you know, somebody came up onto the property or whether. I've, I've said from the beginning, everything is on the table. It's everything is possible. OK, in between that, there were some other things that came about. And uh, we're going to I'll talk about that later uh, after, you know, I'm going to let you get back to your family later on here in, in a little bit. Or I would keep you all night, brother. Trust me. <laughs> Tr you, trust me. But I've got Mary coming on uh, after you, which is uh, the sister of um, the father of the missing little girl. So, first of all, give us an idea, J.C., Give the world, and by the way, we got almost 8,000 people in chat right now uh, watching us, okay? And give us an idea of the scope, uh, if you can. And first, let's talk worldwide, and then let's kind of break it down, you know, here in North America, what you guys are seeing and what the trends are uh, in relationship to talking to Ellie and uh, on the boots on the ground. For sure. Well, I, I think first and foremost, it would be it would be uh, good to establish a, a motive for this. I mean, being a former cop myself, what, why? You know, I ask the reason why. Why do we have this problem? And it, it's not unique to other things that we deal with in the criminal element. It's a lucrative market. There is a lot of money involved, and that's usually what it surrounds is money and opportunity. And so and that shouldn't be familiar right i mean we, we see the similar patterns in, in a lot of criminal behavior um but it really just depends uh we we do know this we we know that western folks people that have faces that look like yours and mine have been reported to for years to be traveling to foreign space for the purpose of the illicit sex trade that occurs in different regions of the world. And I think many folks know that that's not a surprise. And we often equate that to uh, nothing nefarious per se, meaning that perhaps it's legal in that country for prostitution or for that trade to exist. But of course, the demand, you know, as the demand grows, those nefarious purposes start to creep in. Well, maybe we could make more money if we offered this. Uh, perhaps younger folks and younger younger workers, because that's that's something that you know is frowned upon in other places. And so we've seen a lot of that in a lot of countries where, in particular, young children. Uh, very young in age would surprise folks all the way up to teenagers are being, you know, are being capitalized as a part of this solution for these people to make money, which is just sickening and wrong. Uh, so we have the sex trade that is that is in many places uh, of note too. recently. We've we've seen an uptick in labor trafficking, of course, again, revolving around money, folks that maybe are in situations where they need an opportunity to make money and they're led to an organization that, that promises them, you know, a better paying wage or something like that. And it might be in foreign space, meaning foreign from where they're from. And they get there and, you know, their passports are taken and their personal information 
and then they're trapped in a place that they don't know with the, the, where they're dependent on this person who is alleged to have helped them. And, you know, and, and you could just go all down all kinds of de- evil and dark alleyways, you know, in this space. And, and I don't, I mean, it just breaks your heart, to be honest with you. And it, it's, it's different in different parts of the globe, but it's still the same. It's people that are just being exploited and taken advantage of for nefarious purposes, whether that be work, whether that be sex, whether that be um, anything, you know, if there's a market for it, these people that want to make money are going to try to capitalize on that. You know, I heard, I heard Tim uh, talk about the, one of the new trends, which is really scary uh, on top of all the other scary stuff uh, is organ harvesting. Is that, yeah. I mean, good grief. Give me, help me understand that one, brother. I don't know that I can understand it. I mean, it, it, what a terrible thing if you think about it. it it's just awful. But again, um, there's a market that's driving that, right? There, there, it, it's, it's about money. It's about gain. And it's just really unfortunate that it's really unfortunate that human beings are doing this to other human beings. I mean, atrocious. I think it's an issue that's so out there in terms of offensive that a lot of us just want to avoid the topic. We want to avoid the discussion because it's uncomfortable and it just seems just so far out there. And uh, it's not, I mean, we're seeing this, we're, we're seeing this in our work as we try to empower law enforcement around the globe that they're, they're dealing with this. And, you know, you talk about North America and, and I mean, I just got to say, I'm a, I'm a super proud American. I think that we are just so blessed to live where we live. That doesn't mean that we're immune from some of the stuff in terms of exploitation and trafficking, but we also are not seeing things here as much as we might see them somewhere else where perhaps law enforcement infrastructure is lacking or, you know, where there are political strifes or issues with countries, you know, with all kinds of issues. Um, you know, so in North America, it does look different than, than the organ harvesting that you speak of. You know, it, it would be uh, it would be misguided to get on. And, and, and it's really it would be misguided to get on and say that we're seeing that here in the U.S. because that that seems really far out there. And we're not referencing the U.S. when I talk about the, the organ harvesting, but the sex trafficking, the labor trafficking, absolutely. Um, there's There was a, a recent case here in Utah just a week ago where uh, law enforcement agencies took down a labor trafficking slash sex trafficking ring right here in the Salt Lake City area. If you Google it, you would be able to read about it. It involved massage parlors. And there was an element of migrant workers being trafficked to get here to be the masseuse uh and and i i don't know what 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 led them to that work that employment i'm sure at some point in time knowing what i know i'm sure somebody pitched them to come to work saying hey we can help you out financially here maybe they got here and it wasn't something that they thought they would be doing maybe they came willingly we don't know but it's it's worth talking about when those cases come out it's here um you see it and if you talk to any cop that's working the street or that works in a vice unit like you did, Chris, they're going to tell you stories about this, about how they've seen it in their career. Yeah. It, what's interesting is, so if we take on a global perspective and, and tell me if I have the numbers right here, because I read 24.9 people, uh, 24.9 million worldwide and about 2 million of those potentially could be children. Are, are those statistics, are those accurate? I mean, I've read those statistics as well. I, again, we're talking about a number so hard to quantify, right? Sure, it's, right. But we do know that we do know the numbers are high. We, we feel that it's a prevalent issue. Uh, we're not bashful in saying that we believe it's a prevalent issue. Obviously, we're dedicated to working in this space to help um, liberate those that are that are impacted by this. So there's a there's an interesting study you may um, find. Uh, it's it was done by TBI Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Uh, unfortunately, it was a 2013 study, so it's a little it's eight years old. 
but I think it just kind of maybe gives us a little idea uh, about that particular region. And, and I'm going to ask you about that here in a second. But here, here's what they said in the study, and it was done by the University of Colorado Boulder. It says, uh, people often think that all child sex traffickers kidnap their victims. But in many cases, the children end up funneled into the system by their own families because of extreme poverty and or drugs or alcohol. According to assistant professor Anne Jeanette Rosagaga, R-O-S-G-A, Rosgag. Sometimes the children leave home voluntarily because of abuse or of other harmful conditions. She went on to say, the global sex trade is as much a product of everyday people struggling to survive due to dire economic straits as it is an organized crime problem. Attacking the crime and not the pro poverty is treating the symptom, but not the disease. Now, that is a really interesting, you know, hypothesis. And because what, what I think maybe she's saying is drugs, alcohol, poverty are three precursors potentially for children, okay, to be into the, let's, let's just say the SA lane, right? SA, okay, lane, okay. Uh, YouTube doesn't like us using, you know, the actual word. So I just say SA. Uh, and you had an opportunity to talk to some folks in uh, LA, LASD, right? LA Sheriff, uh, just the other I day. Did. Yeah, I mean, like, part of my role right now is, is I, I get the privilege to, to talk to cops that specialize in, in this field across the nation as we seek for ways to empower them. And so in preparation for this show, I mean, I've been retired for about six months, and so I wanted this to be relevant to make sure that we had real, you know, these are these were officers that I spoke with this week. Hey, give me some trends. You know, what are you seeing? Uh, and, and trends change. Uh, we we had to change up policing many times in terms of how we we caught folks and how we solve crime because criminals evolve too. Um, but as you can imagine in the U.S., one of the major trends that we see, it, it comes in the form of exploitation, and it's done th through online efforts. And I mean, if you think about it, we live in a day and age where we are all walking around uh, with a, what is the equivalent of a computer in our pocket where we can search. We have all these social platforms social media platforms and these are very popular amongst our teenagers in particular and our children who are in that vulnerable age class of being able to make appropriate decisions with that type of technology and as i spoke i spoke to three different uh three different detectives that specialize in uh, exploitation cases and child uh SA abuse cases, I'll, I'll say that to, to yep. save you hopefully from getting moderated on here. Um, and it was always the same. It, 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 the trend involves generally somebody soliciting these children, we'll call them children because they're under the age of 18, uh, on the platforms that they're on. That might be a social media outlet, that might be a video game outlet where they're playing, they, they do classic grooming that we know takes place all the time they the grooming you know just means they're making friends with these kids they're they're becoming a familiar staple in that platform that they see and you know generally they start complimenting these kids oh you look beautiful in this picture or oh you're really good at this video game i love it when you're here playing and then they start asking for pictures and things like that and it starts slow and the trend that they each told me that they're seeing now is this trend of giving gifts where they tell the kids i'm going to send you a gift and they may send them an amazon package or something else and then it's almost like a front like they want to give them something and then they ask send me a picture um and of course, those pictures happen and go, and then, and then now 
like I would just use the example that one detective gave me. He's working a case where there's a, a 14 year old girl who started down this path with a with an offender somewhere at, who is now being exploited. And she had sent a topless picture to this individual. And of course, after that happened and after there was some back and forth with that, now she's uh, being told, you know, I'm going to send this to your whole family. I'm going to send this to your school unless you do this for me, which usually involves more pictures, more abuse or money. Um, and we have adults that are getting exploited the same exact way. I mean, when I was a when I was a, a cop six months ago, I, I retired in a supervisory role, but often my team members would have cases like that that they would bring in and they would say, this woman started chatting with this person online. She started sending him pictures and now he's exploiting her for money and uh, threatening to send it to her work and her, you know, and these are the grooming things that they figure out. They get to know these kids um, to where they can really leverage them in that position where they have something over them. And I mean, it's just, it's terrible. And the the officers each spoke with me and said that they find it astounding that parents are not questioning when a package arrives on the door, like, hey, who did this come from? Maybe the kid has a credit card and, and that the parent lets them use and they just order stuff as they need it. I mean, this is the day and age we live in. I mean, we, we do, you can get anything online shipped to your door. Uh, and it goes from that extreme all the way up to meetups, of course, where abuse occurs, uh, where kidnappings can occur. Um, it, it just it goes into the dark alley of production of this type of material to distribute to others, uh, which has money involved. And it's just it's it's crazy. The one detective that I spoke with said that, uh, you know, 15 years ago, they may get just a couple of cyber tips a month, right? He told me, I talked to him yesterday, two days ago, he is 112 cyber tips in the hole right now, meaning that he's 112 behind to investigate. He works for a small agency. Uh, it's he and a couple other team members that focus in this area. So what that means and chris is shaking his head because he knows he's not going to get to those 112 cases that's so much work and so it's just uh it's crazy the the connection that i had in la county said that gang members and gangs are getting involved in this business now because there's money in it um they're they're leveraging social media to do it um there's international connections where we have people in the us that are that are chatting with people overseas that are paying them money to put their kids on cameras. That, again, not my theories. This came right from officers I spoke with this week. And so it's just, it's astounding to be honest with you. And I think it's a subject that most people don't really know the magnitude of what's out there and what our, what our cops are seeing across the nation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting. I, um, you know, I in reading this study, one of the other things that it pointed out here, it says kids whose parents, and this is, by the way, uh, if you're just joining with us, uh, I have J.C. Holt here from Operation Underground Railroad, uh, and uh, their link's going to be in our chat here. Um, if And I'm reading from a study from TBI, uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, so what I'm reading here, you can go online, uh, it's going to be below. Uh, when the uh, when we're done with this live, so you'll be able to click on it there and go read it. Uh, but here's one of the really interesting uh, points that uh, TVI discovered. It says kids, who, and this is a quote: kids whose parents abuse alcohol or drugs are three times more likely to be verbally, physically, or sexually abused, and four times more likely to be neglected according to this re uh, recent TBI study. Now, you know, you and I know that, you know, we've seen a couple of things in our time, right? And um, what's really interesting is back in, it, well, by the time it was over, it was 1995. Uh, I coined 
uh, back then, uh, the emergence of the white collar uh, intellectual predator. Okay? And in fact, when I was at an ICAC conf conference with John, uh, and by the way, the Northwestern, uh, Northwest uh, is happening up in Seattle, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I was we'll supposed to, yeah, I was supposed to go present, but uh, I got Dr. Larry Simons, uh, who uh, is going to come on the show here uh, in a couple of weeks. Him, uh, Greg Cooper, and Dean are presenting, as I told them I had a conflict, and which I did. And um, anyway, long story short, back then, believe it or not, JC, what we were seeing in SoCal was the ladies of the evening were complaining that the Johns weren't coming out. And this was 1993 is when we first started hearing about it because in San Diego County, we had 43 body dumps. Uh, they were out in off of Interstate 8 and Interstate 10 and they put together the San Diego County Homicide Task Force. This was late 80s, early uh, 90s, okay? Long story short, um, we discovered that the internet kicked off in 1993. And so we had six kids at that time in San Diego County who were victims of homicide. And so the question was, did the suspect change their victimology? Okay. Did, was this suspect going from those types of women to children? That was just the big question mark. Okay. So I was tasked with interviewing uh, some folks. And so guess what we discovered collectively was, was the number one complaint, right? That the guys on the street that were coming out at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning now were more violent. And as a result of that, the girls were getting violently hurt, strangled, that kind of stuff. And one girl rolled out, uh, and I can say her name now, uh, Frederica Goldstein is her name. Okay, we should call her Freddie. Okay? And another one uh, who actually ended up, um, uh, Valisa Ray Joy, uh, who ended up a victim of this suspect. Here's, here's where I'm going with this. That was then. <coughs> okay. Now fast forward to what you guys are dealing with. And when I saw some of your guys in uh, Boise, uh, I think a year or two ago, when, whenever you guys did the operation in Peru, I think it was, or something like that down in South America. J anyway, John brought me in uh, for, and long story short, I was talking to your guys and I was blown away. I, I was absolutely blown away. Um, you dropped off just for a second. I was 100% blown away by what I was hearing. And so now, you know, fast forward, okay, to what you guys are dealing with. And what are you learning about North America? And let's specifically talk about trafficking avenues on the East, if you have any, if you have any information that you can share with us. Well, I mean, again, I, I think what we're seeing, <clears throat> when you hit the nail right on the head, the, these criminals are finding, they're finding loopholes and ways around law enforcement efforts to stifle this and so you know just multiple areas I, I think about folks that are at high risk to be trafficked or exploited and you hinted on this regarding those things of of children who perhaps are in homes where there's substance abuse occurring or where there's neglect i hear when, when you say that what i hear is vulnerability i hear of a vulnerable person that doesn't have somebody that that's looking out for them or should be they're focused on something else and so the trends that we see sometimes involve folks that are vulnerable for whatever situation perhaps these are people that have come into the country from other countries because they're seeking a better life here in the united states whether you know what a, maybe they're a refugee from another country and they're vulnerable and so I think that's a trend that we can always say with law enforcement is that 
we have criminals that are lurking, looking for vulnerability, finding that vulnerability and then capitalizing on it for monetary gain. And, you know, in my, in my 20 years, one thing I learned pretty quickly is most, most criminals, they're lazy. You know, they want the path of least resistance. They want to find that vulnerable person to exploit. They don't want the person that's educated. They don't want the kid that, that is going to tell them, no, you're a stranger. Get away from me. They want the person that they can groom, that they can bring in. And you spoke to something a little bit about uh, perhaps parents that are going through situations where poverty is an issue and they think that they can make money. Again, I hear the word vulnerability when you say that. That's a vulnerable situation for somebody that's down on their luck and, and a way for them to turn a buck, you know, to pay rent, to pay bills, whatever. And so I just think that that's a trend that we, we always see, you know, that's there. But every cop that I talk to, exploitation cases are up. Uh, this type of abuse is up. It's not trending in a good direction. Uh, it's consistently going up. You know, you, you mentioned that since 1993, things have, have changed since 1993, but the ugliness of it still remains the same. And I suppose in, in 2043, you know, it'll still be ugly. It'll still be a gigantic subject. Um, we certainly hope not, but I just know better, you know, from my law enforcement career of just seeing that there, there's just the things that other human beings will do to other human beings for gain or for money, it's, it's sickening. And so I don't know of any like specific trends that I, I don't want to get in the weeds too much with this, with agencies that are there, but every one of them that I talk to always tell me the same thing. There's plenty of work. There's plenty of people that are trying to capitalize on this and there are plenty of victims and that's what we need to change. That's where we'd like that trend to go down. And I think educating folks on it, such as you're doing with this show, are a great effort to do that. We have an effort to do that as well as an organization, to tell the stories, to give the perspective that we can give. That, uh, And when I say that we can give, sometimes this involves ongoing or active cases. You know, we, we don't want to compromise any information on that. But that's why you see the documentaries. That's why you see things is it, it captivates and captures attention to bring attention to the issue because this is a big issue that honestly our cops and law enforcement are not going to solve alone. This is an issue that can boil all the way down to the home, to families, to parents, uh, to caretakers of vulnerable people. They need to know th these trends. They need to know what to watch out for, what to look for so that they can protect those that are in their midst uh, from these people that would take advantage of their loved ones and of, of, people that they know and, and appreciate. You know, what's interesting, and, and this is going to be a really shocking statistic, I think, for people, but the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2004, okay, and they reviewed over 450,000 child SA files. Okay. In 2019, in a five-year period, or excuse me, uh, in a 15-year period, they reviewed 70 million child SA files. 70 million. It went from 450,000 in 2004 to 70 million in 2019. That is 15 years. Now, now think about this, folks. When when we got JC here, this Tim was part, uh, Tim Ballard, who started Operation Underground, the nonprofit, and um, we've got JC here, who's the Director of Law Enforcement Relationships for the organization. In just in that short time, and one of the things that uh, my phone went off the hook, so I retired in 07. So 82 to 07 was my time in the bucket, right? And then I went, uh, went with the 501c3 that I'm with, Cold Case Foundation. Anyway, long story short, the projection at that time in 95, and by the way, people don't really uh, remember, the first picture in the internet was sent in 1995. Okay. Now, since that time then, uh, 
there was a projection uh, today of 78% of all images and videos analyzed depict children under 12 years of age. And that number, okay, is going lower and lower and lower. Okay. Uh, and, and there's a reason for it. And I love Tim's explanation. I, 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 you know, watched a little of his biography and stuff uh, where even when what, what we were projecting back, back then, and that was just to kind of see if somebody had changed their victimology, right? You know, and their, their choice of victims, okay? uh, for those of us who just joining. Okay? And back then, we saw that as the Internet started to expand, the individual who would choose uh, to be in that game was forced, if they didn't have the intellectual paralysis, to compete with the doctors, the lawyers, you know, all of these intellects who were getting into these chat rooms and, and looking for that 14-year-old, 13, 12, whatever, okay? And they were competing with that other guy who used to be on the street, and we used to call him the trench coat guy, and you know who I'm talking about, JC, right? <laughs> that he, he, they're, they're usually not, they weren't usually the sharpest tool in the shed, and the Wesley Allen Dodds of the world, okay? So this guy, these guys had to have a place to go. And what the projection was and the, and the, the hypothesis and, the, and the, the thought process was, where are they going to go? Well, they're forced now into a voyeurism role. And at some point, that fantasy fuel has to be expelled onto the street, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they can't compete in the rooms, okay? That was the guy that the ladies of the evening were complaining about. It was a marketing problem. Okay? And as a result of that, we started to see trends start to kick. In 1998, my phone went off the hook, and that was right after the Dateline NBC to catch a predator showed up on the scene. And you had brain surgeons, you had cops, you had judges, lawyers. They all were all showing up at the front door for that 14-year-old, for that et cetera. Today, you guys are seeing stuff that I can only imagine what's going on. Now, I know in totality with the East Coast, with Atlanta being a big hub, uh, a lot of human trafficking teams, uh, you know, being put together across, you know, task force. In Tennessee, they took down... Uh, I think 18 guys in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, most of those victims and survivors were older uh, teenagers, uh, you know, uh, forced into, you know, inappropriate behavior by these thugs. Um, but in this particular case, it's I'm wondering what you what you guys are seeing more prevalent out there. What is the most prevalent type of um, problem are you are you guys actually running into and then i want to talk about all the great things you're doing in terms of be donating dogs uh and talking a little bit about how you're uh throwing curveballs at bad guys okay so yeah. take take the first question and then we'll hit into the second concept well and then i'm i'm assuming you're talking north america right we want to stick north america is that what you mean yeah. with this okay um, sure. I think I think one of the trends for sure that we have to mention is just the uptick in child pornography. Uh, it's it's so prevalent now. You spoke to many points here that to me are, uh, you know, there's direct correlation, and I think there's correlation that sometimes we we don't see. For example, and this this bleeds over into international space as well. You have the you have the person who's obviously secured an appetite for themselves to participate in this disgusting behavior. You know, they didn't just wake up one day and decide to do this. So what fuels it? And, and one of the things that Tim talks about a lot, and I think he's spot on, and I would echo this, is the pornography um, industry in terms of its accessibility and just it's readily available to everybody and the variety of it, it, it just continues to increase. And of course, you know, you start going down deep, dark 
alleys with that and it's not good enough anymore and you're right the person that you talk about can't satisfy the appetite anymore and so they go to the street and you know they may go to places where they know that they can participate in that on the street and then that's not enough so then maybe they travel to foreign space you know meaning international space where it's more acceptable or they think they can get away with it and we see that trend but the child pornography is huge uh, I, I was talking to a, a large western metropolitan area not in california um, but close by and the agents that worked there on that were telling me they were doing two to three search warrants per week on deep web investigations where they're doing back-end work on ip addresses and everything else to go in and recover uh child pornography from from perpetrators and that's just what they're getting to and so i would imagine as they're mining for that information that there's a wealth of it out there so one of the trends that we see is definitely that it's it's on the rise it's a it's a very lucrative market for those that are involved in it and it's a very underground network in terms of the, these people trade and exchange images amongst each other and share that uh, ugly rapport with one another you know that they're they're into the same things so we definitely see that they would always say that and it's a it's a hard thing to fight because this is crime that is occurring from people's living rooms right or their bedrooms uh, this isn't like you can't solve this with having more patrol officers or police presence because they're doing it in the confines of and privacy of their home and that is particularly challenging for law enforcement officers because you know we're out we're out in the field i say we i'm not there anymore you can tell where my heart is still is with those officers that are doing that um and that makes it just particularly difficult for them um so that was the first point remind me of your second point again that you want to be a touch on how you guys are uh helping le combat the problem with some of our four-legged friends yeah for sure um obviously we have a we have a renewed effort at operation underground railroad to to just empower and help law enforcement in the united states it's not new it's something the organization's been doing for some time and uh we we do that through a variety of means but what chris is referring to here is we have a program where we have established a good relationship with an individual out of uh the indianapolis area that that trains uh electronic search dogs esd canines and it's amazing the work that these dogs do it's so amazing if you've ever had the chance to watch a police canine work it's amazing anyway but as we as we all know dogs have noses that are much more powerful than human noses and they in short they have isolated a component that is a common makeup uh that that coats SD cards, USB drives, hard drives, computers, cell phones, you name it. They've isolated that, developed the scent technology where the dog can then be trained to indicate that on it. And they're deploying these dogs on these search warrants to find these often itty bitty little pieces of evidence. I mean, and the stories of these dogs finding this evidence in places, it's just amazing. Tape under desks, um, we, we've had cases where the dogs have found little SD cards in wall outlets where you would plug a plug in, you know. Uh, officers can find these things too, but can you just imagine the amount of time and, and Chris, you know, you've been on the search warrants where you're looking for something and it, it's, it's hard. It's the worst part of the warrant is you, you want, you get in there, you want to make sure that you don't miss something. So these dogs are empowering the officers to go in and use tools that we don't have, i.e. their nose, to sniff that out. Um, OUR has sponsored opportunities for uh, 24 agencies across the nation to date to, to get these dogs. That's and amazing. We're, we're trying to continue to grow this, and these dogs are generally always attached to uh, primarily with ICAT teams, Internet, children, Internet Crimes Against Children, 
So they're with specialty teams that this is their bread and butter at the police department. This is what they do day in and day out. Um, that's just one of the programs we have, but I mean, we're just doing anything we can to empower law enforcement to get them the tools that they need, primarily from a funding viewpoint, if we're being honest, uh, to, to help them out, to lift them as, the, as they serve in this effort. I'm trying to find my Jack Russell. He would be an, uh, you know, you could put him up into the, the, <laughs> the, the heat yeah. vents, yeah. right up, up into the, up into the roof. Let me see if I can get by got to see this guy. Oh, man. So yeah. he, this guy here would be absolutely amazing. His play drive is so is so crazy. I could put him up in the, you know, the the heater vents, right? Because yeah. they they love little places. If the bad guys had, but hey, how come you're not saying anything? What's your problem <laughs> tonight? <laughs> That's awesome. He, this guy's this guy's amazing. Well, JC, I'll tell you, you are an absolute amazing educational guy. So let's take a couple of questions for you. Are you okay with that about your organization? Sure. That would be okay. great. Okay, so guys, uh, before uh, JC uh, kicks off with us here, I want to give him some time to answer some questions. And then we have uh, Mary, uh, you know, a surprise guest coming up uh, right after JC because I'm going to let him run uh, get to his family. Uh, but so let's see. Uh, let's uh, put up a uh, Dylan. If you see a couple of questions come up, let's take you know four or five questions for uh, JC. And if you're just with us tonight, guys, I have JC Holt here from Operation Underground uh, Re uh, Rescue. Okay, here's one. It just came up. Good. How can we help in our local community, JC? Hey, that's a great question. I think the way that you can help in your local community is find those that are working in this space and ask them how you can help them. Uh, perhaps you have uh, a woman shelter in your area that takes in a lot of folks that say have been victims of exploitation or abuse. There are service opportunities there. Uh, just, just getting a passion for that and then spreading education and awareness on that. Obviously our police officers need our support. They do, they need our support now and, and if you, it, that whole motto, if you see something, say something, is so true. Um, if you see things going on in your local communities and neighborhoods that don't seem right to you, they're probably not right. Talk with your officers, establish rapport with them, and, and just uh, be passionate about not having tolerance for this kind of stuff that, that may be happening in your hometown. There... Um... Perfect. What else have we got, Dill? I, I saw one in here about uh, organ donors when they're not being matched. That that is, I I have no idea I'm on the medical side of that. Uh, I, so yeah, I, I really I can't. Know. Oh, here it is. I don't right know there. either. Um, yeah, Holly uh, Harris. I I I don't know that answer personally. And I don't Jason, know that I have a lot of you know expertise anything? in that area um, either. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get into the weeds and something that I just don't know enough about. Obviously there's a lucrative market for it. That's why we're seeing the drive to do it. And, and we all know, you know, here in the United States, we have tight regulations and stuff. It's not that way in other parts of the world. It, there's, there's more flexibility and policy in the way that the people do things. And so maybe that feeds into that, but so I'll take this one, Joe. Me, why do they not name uh, of the predators? Actually, if they get picked up in an operation, uh, you, your local newspaper sometimes will blast them uh, all over uh, the news that they got busted. Uh, that's never a good day for those guys. Uh, Meredith McKenzie asked, and thank you, Meredith. You're very kind. Is it okay to ask women questions if you work at a woman's shelter? Such a fine line about privacy. JC. Well, I do know a little bit about this. I spent many years as a domestic violence detective working with women's shelters, and uh, there are privacy things there in terms of getting information from them that you could then turn over to police, of course, violates some, some anti-privacy um, clauses. However, it, it, there's so much more that goes into this with helping people rather than just reporting it to cops. I mean, if you work at a woman's shelter, 
I would say that it would be great for you to try to gather as much insight as you can to help whoever is in that shelter. And, you know, if they've been trafficked, if they've been exploited, there are, there are different avenues of treatment and, and ways to explore that. And of course that might not be able to, you know, we might not get information where uh, we can pass that directly on the law enforcement unless they give us permission to do so. But just educating them on the importance of, of, of getting that in the hands of our law enforcement can also be very empowering to law enforcement because, you know, they're not in a position of getting all of the information sometimes. Many of these folks don't self-report. Uh, they're worried about other issues. They may be worried about immigration, um, anything else, and, and just standing behind letting them know that you're willing to lift and help and support and, and that you want to help them, I think can be very empowering for survivors. Interesting. So one of our mods, Maui Girl, who we love, she's amazing. She, she, she asked at the interview room, can you tell everyone about the course on your website? And I, there, I, I assume she may be talking about the signs of trafficking course that we have, or just some of the educational material. Um, it's just, it's, it's uh, collected information that's concise and in, in a format where we hope that it's easy to learn and read and gain perspective on this issue so that you could pick up on little signs that maybe you're seeing uh, day in and day out, depending on where you're at or where you live or who you associate with, that you might not attribute to being something involved in this space. And it gets you thinking in a different way where you're like, oh, you know, that, that actually could be a sign of abuse, um, seeing that. And again, this this oftentimes is subtle, right? I mean, how many, how many times in the field, Chris, were you talking to people about something that they might see they didn't attribute that behavior as being suspicious but you being a trained officer you looked at it and you said oh boy i know what's going on there i think that there's this element you know so anyway yeah it's it's pretty interesting so in this particular case a lot of folks uh there is a video of this little girl dancing in front of a red barrel uh, that says for sale on it. But, you know, can you see in your experience uh, around the world, how do, how do they advertise these children uh, potentially for sale? Well, these are networks. I mean, these are networks of people that this isn't something you just Google, right? <laughs> um, or use Bing or any other platform that you might have. They, they trade and exchange pornography back and forth uh, on the dark web and then they, they just get deeper and into more levels where they then um, have networks criminal networks that are there it's really no different than any other criminal network i mean if you wanted to buy a, a pound of methamphetamine there are ways to find that pound of methamphetamine that these people find it's the same in this space uh and, and it's really an inner circle and they do keep it that way on purpose to try to stay on the down low, right? They're, they're not interested in losing their freedom. They're not interested in losing their business and the money that it's bringing them. Yeah. Uh, what country uh, traffics more than the U.S.? That's really hard. I, I don't know that I have a specific answer to that question. And I, I really don't want to dime out any particular country. I am of the belief that this type of thing doesn't respect boundaries. Um, it doesn't, res you know, in, in terms of geographical boundaries and things like that, it's a prevalent issue across the world. And so really hard to attribute that just off the cuff with more numbers, uh, you know, but there are some hot zones that we see. And I think a lot of people are familiar with those um, that, that we read about. But I think oftentimes people, uh, they think of the movie Taken you know, and they think, oh, it goes down like that. And I'm not suggesting that it, that it couldn't, but it just seems to be what we see is so much more subtle at times. And it's not, you know, it's not that Hollywood production type level of stuff. So it's everywhere. Um, but, and it's everywhere and it fits into that social status of the country where it's at. Yeah, I love this. I love this name, JC. Look at this. PH dangerously overeducated. <laughs> Absolutely classic. Okay, so 
we'll we'll let you uh this is going to be uh the last one here and, and then we're going to bring in mary but show here's the question and then i'm going to give you the final word my friend and and you take as much time as you need here but here's the question first how where could someone train to be a volunteer it's a great question um we are we are blessed as an organization to have tens of thousands of volunteers um and and that's a key part of this movement uh to rise up in behalf of of children and exploited victims uh, you can find information on our website about becoming a volunteer we have volunteer uh teams across the united states in most states actually and if you get on our website we can hook you up with who has been designated as a volunteer team lead and we actually have an entire department or division of our company that works and manages the efforts of those volunteers and uh there you know there, there's so many cool things happening with the volunteer program just in terms of education and awareness um, bringing light to the issue, shining light into the dark, uh, and illuminating the way for others to see that. And then again, just bringing more light into it. So that's a great question. I'm glad that somebody asked that because it's a question we often get. How do we get involved? How do we do this? Um, it's amazing uh, working in this space, not because it's bright <laughs> work, um, it's ugly, it's dark. What's amazing about it is the passion for people that people have to fight against it. It's a universal passion. Uh, it's easy, it's an easy cause to get behind and it's a worthwhile cause. And there are many people that are impacted and affected by this ugly plague that we have. And so those of us that, that uh, have strong disdain for it and want to make a difference there are ways that we are doing that we're trying to learn those ways and and they change uh with the trending changes that, that criminals make as well and so thank you for that question all right buddy you've uh if you're just joining us uh we've had jc holt here uh from operation underground railroad uh i'm going to give him the last word uh, to tell us about his organization. Everything uh, is going to be in the links below, guys, uh, that you're going to be able to go over. They have a donation page. They are 501c3. Uh, they are catching bad guys as well as helping law enforcement uh, catch those guys by buying dogs, uh, special type of dogs that can scent uh, certain types of materials. Uh, and so, and that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, get involved with these guys. Uh, they can always use more help, but go over to their web page. You're going to see it down there. Uh, JC, first of all, what an, what an absolute pleasure uh, it is to have, you know, you to call you a friend. Uh, and then, you know, you're better looking than John uh, when you picked up. <laughs> Uh, when you picked up the phone, buddy, uh, and I know I know he's a dear friend of both of ours. Uh, please send you know my best to uh, your team over there uh, with what you guys do. It's absolutely uh, incredible, God's work. You are on God's mission, and you know the universe is on schedule, my friend. You have the final word. Uh, go ahead and tell us uh, what's on your mind, my buddy. No, I just, I really appreciate the opportunity, Chris, that you've given me to come on and, and represent this company that I work for now. And, and I'm super passionate about this cause. Uh, I do think there is a lot of hope moving forward that we can make a difference and impact this space through, through storytelling and offering perspective. When I say storytelling, I mean just that, not making things up, but telling accounts of what we see and what we know. Uh, that has been proven in criminal cases and stuff to educate folks on this to to shine a light and like i said this is not a problem or a a, a situation that any one group is going to be able to fight alone it's going to take a universal effort which means our law enforcement officers those that are in the aftercare space that are that are working with survivors family members, parents, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters, 
and just everybody in the human race to to uh, just stand up for those that uh, that are enslaved to this type of of, of terrific you know this this prolific abuse that we see it's a terrific cause to be involved in um and we're we are interested always in sharing our perspective on it and engaging other folks to get involved and empowering those that are involved um and it's just a it's a great opportunity we just thank you for the for the chance to come on to your show and just talk about it briefly and I hope everybody is having a good Sunday evening and that they had a great weekend as we start a new work week tomorrow. It was, uh, it was a very reminiscent week for, for America with just 9-11 happening and, and thinking over some of those sacrifices and looking at the world 20 years since then. And it's been a very reflective week. So I would just challenge uh, anybody that might have been listening to this tonight to reflect on this issue, reflect on this issue and, and educate yourself on it and see what you can do to uh, to do better, to be better. And that could look different for everybody, but that's how we'll make an impact. That's how we'll make a change. And, and that's what we aim to do here. Outstanding. Well said. Uh, well, well said. And so uh, thank you so much for everything, uh, for coming on. I'll circle back with you uh, and uh, we'll catch up uh, after this. Uh, I'm going to bring Mary in here for a minute, and uh, I'm going to let you meet Mary real fast. Hang on. Miss Mary, Miss Mary, hi. Hi. How are you? Good, good. good. Meet JC. Meet JC. He's, on the, He's on the hunt for a bad, bad guy. Hi, JC. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Mary? I'm good. How are you, Mary? I'm doing great. So, so Mary, Mary is a survivor. Is a survivor. JC. JC. And... And uh, she's got a she's case got going a there, case in, going Utah. there well, in Utah. Well, I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you um, uh, offline about it. Offline my friend. about it, my friend. Okay. Okay. JC, thanks, JC, again. thanks again. I'm going to cut, gonna you, cut loose, you loose, buddy. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> okay. Mary. Mary. Yes. How are you, Chris? Good. 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 I can hear. I, I can, can hear some. I can hear uh, some um, Echo, do you have, uh, you have uh, something, else, something on? else on the YouTube um, channel or anything? No, yeah. not that yeah. I know of. Um, okay. Is it still okay. echoing a little bit? or? Nope, nope, nope it just nope, stopped. It just stopped. Oh, okay. Well, yes, it is. Well, yes, it's it still. Is. It's still... <laughs> um, I love it. I love it. We had this problem with Teresa. No problem. No problem. No problem. Yeah. No problem. So it, sometimes, it, sometimes if you have, if the, you have the YouTube, YouTube link open, uh, it it's playing back playing through, back the, through speakers. the speakers. Oh, you know what? I think I so, might. Hold so, on. Hold on a sec. Let me see. Okay. No problem. Take okay, your time. No problem. Take your time. You there? You there? Yeah. Let me. Let me go. <laughs> Mary, she's so cute. Uh, guys, what, was that fascinating or what with Operation Underground? We're waiting for Mary to come back in here. Uh, I'll tell you, man, oh, man. Um, it, it, this is some really interesting things happening uh, around the world here with this problem. And uh, we'll get into it a little bit more here Um as we uh, you know have a little chat here with Mary, she's got a lot to talk about tonight, um, and so we'll just give her a couple of seconds. In the interim, uh, let me take a a look at some of the things uh, in chat. See how you guys are doing. Uh, let's see here. How bad is traffic in Tennessee? You know that is a great question. So, just to let you know, they uh, TBI just put together a human trafficking um, task force. So we can get into get that into here, that in, a here in a second. Okay, so that's okay, so probably, that's just, probably me, Mayor. just me, Mayor. Okay, is that any better? Or? Uh, you know uh, what? You know what? It, it's it, okay. It's okay. okay. <laughs> can you guys can you hear, guys an, hear echo? an echo? Put a one in there. In there. If you hear an, echo, you hear two an echo, two for no. Two for no. 
And if not, and then, if it's not just then it's just me. Can you guys hear me? Okay, we got okay, half. We got I got half, one. Got one. So that means, so that yes, means they, yes, they they're getting an, they're echo, getting as an well. echo as well. It is an echo. Okay. So sometimes, so sometimes that happens, that happens when, you, when have you have open links somewhere, open somewhere outside, right. of outside of StreamYard. StreamYard. Is that so, any better? So testing. Testing. Is that any better? Nope. It's still nope, coming it's through. It's still coming through. So that. So that. Uh, let's see. Chris is, but uh, Mary Chris isn't. Chris is, but Mary isn't. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. The 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 mic. It. What's the, happening the mic, is it, what's we're happening hearing is, it backwards. We're hearing it backwards. It, it, yeah, it's not coming through my yeah, mic it's here. It's not coming through my mic here. Mm -hmm. So okay. let's do this. So let's do this. Do you have a? Do you have, you have a, earpods you have in? Earpods in? No, no, I don't have any earpods. No problem. No problem. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mic out. I'm gonna mic out as you, as uh, you talk. Uh, Is that talk. okay with you? Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So. Okay, perfect. So, first of all, first let's of all, catch up. Let's How are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm doing great. Awesome. Uh, now awesome. we had a chance to talk uh, earlier we had today. A chance to talk earlier today. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. And, and you wanted to you wanted clarify, to a, clarify couple a couple of things, you said. Yeah, I did. Um, the other day, um, Donnie was on another YouTube channel. Um, and he was saying a few things um, that I just wanted to clear up. Um, and um, I'm not really quite sure why he was saying them things um but i just wanted to clear up that it didn't happen um he's been calling my dad a lot um i'm not quite sure why my dad's been calling me um i got a phone call today from my dad and i just I just wish Donnie, I don't know if you're watching this or not, but I just wish you would quit calling dad because, I mean, he's basically on his deathbed. And there's a lot of things that he's just not comprehending right now. And so I just wish you would quit calling him because it's not doing anybody any good. Yeah, your father yeah, your has father Alzheimer's. Has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. And, and what is he saying is, when he's talking, he's talking to, your dad? to your dad? Um, he's telling him the to call me and for me to call Jeannie and to he's saying quit quit talking about him, quit doing this, what we're doing to him. And I told my dad, I'm like, we're not doing anything to him, you know? And so my dad gets like confused because he don't know what's going on from one minute to the next. So, you know, I just, it's, he's just really, I don't know. My dad's just not there anymore, you know? And my mom just keeps calling me and, She's like telling me, well, you guys have to quit doing this to Donnie because, you know, it's just, it's making him crazy and stuff. And it's like, well, we're not doing anything to him, you know? I mean, I, I even told my dad the last thing we did was went in and, and pressed charges against him. That was a, like a week ago. So, you know, um, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. So, so hang on, I'm going to mute your, oh, there you go. So, I think one, one way we can solve this is,
Dylan will mute your mic when I talk, and then he'll mute mine as you talk. Okay, so give me a thumbs up because you're muted, <laughs> like me. Okay, so in in this situation like this, okay, remember we talked about triangulation, and so what he's doing, he knows that he can't talk to you anymore, okay, uh, because he's been trying and trying and trying, hasn't he? Yes, actually, well, the last time he tried was last Tuesday. And from about 6 to 8 p.m., he tried calling me six different times. And then when I never picked up, he messaged me. So, and I just tell, I messaged, I messaged him back and told him, you're not supposed to get a hold of me. Quit trying to contact me. And then he said, well... Trish wants you to call her. And I was like, okay, thank you. And then he replied, no, thank you. And then I didn't reply back. And then he replied again. And he said, you're so kind. I don't know if he was saying that to be, um, you know, to be funny or to be, you know, or if he was serious, but I don't know. It was just really weird, and I don't so know. I just so uh, go ahead. So he's continuing to try to basically play mind games with you and prank you again. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, but I'm not going to fall for it. <laughs> you know, fool me once, you know, fool me twice. Yeah, yeah, good point. So make sure you you tell your detective every time you get an email, every time you get a text message, every time you get a phone call, because every time that happens under that Utah statute is harassment, and each time can be a count, a single count. Uh, which, let's say he calls five or six times because you're a survivor of S.A. and a victim at his and his two other friends' hands, okay? every email, he could be charged with a single count. So if there's five emails, that's five counts. Each one of those counts has a sentence behind it. Each one of those counts is a felony. Okay, and as a result of that, okay, those five counts can turn into a long time uh, in, you know, the system. Okay, so make sure you're documenting and make sure you tell the detective, and I know who you're working with, okay, so make sure you tell him that this keeps persisting. Okay, okay, I'm going to mute out now. Uh, tell me what your feelings are. Yeah, um, I actually talked to um, the guy who's working on my on my case, and Roy just uh, he called me like two days ago, and I actually went over some stuff with him, and also because I wanted to know how things were progressing, I usually call him about once every three days or so to keep up on it, you know, to see how things are going, and. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, my mom, okay, and, dad well, okay, keep, well, my mom I, and dad I, keep I, telling me to call Donnie, but I can't. So. Correct. Correct. And so I'm going to have somebody on my show w this Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. And her name is Josephine. And we're going to connect you with her. Okay. She is a victim's advocate. Uh, she is the real deal. And she's coming on my show Wednesday night for a live at 8 o'clock Eastern this Wednesday. It's going to be a special presentation. Okay. Uh, and as a result of that, what, what she does, uh, her daughter uh, was a victim of a homicide in San Diego County. And she's written a book. 
because he is on the U.S. Marshals' uh, most wanted list, the suspect. And she's coming on Wednesday night to talk about her experience. But more importantly, as well as important as that is, she is also a trained, experienced victim's advocate. And I'm going to connect her with you and Jeannie. And she also works uh, for the Cold Case Foundation. So she and you guys can connect and she's going to guide you now that this case is is moving forward. And, and just for, for all of our viewers out there, let's remember there are two issues here. Okay. The first issue is this woman here who came forward on behalf of Summer because she was a victim. And her sister, Jeannie, who's also a survivor and a victim and they came forward forward because they were worried about summer okay now a lot of stuff has been saying things uh online uh you know and soldier girl uh what exactly does this mean w would you explain that for me i don't know who you are uh, i don't i i've never met you in my life but what does selfish Chris mean to you? Uh, I don't take that personally. It's more about you than it is me uh, because I'm here talking uh, a, to a SA survivor. Uh, apparently, you don't understand what that means, or maybe you do. And if you do, put it into the chat for me, please. Um, okay? I would appreciate that. But while Mary's here, uh, you know, I don't understand, you know, how people can, quite frankly, just be so mean. Uh, it's almost like Donnie has a little box of minions, you know, uh, that jump on every once in a while when you show up or when I start, you know, talking about you being a survivor. Um, I'm going to tell the, I, I, I'll continue to tell the world, you know, forever, okay? If you sexually abuse, if you essay somebody, and they come in here, okay, to the world because they're looking to help a five-year-old girl. And you can't see the relevance of that. Uh, this is not the page for you. Uh, this is not the page for you, i.e. this channel, okay, um, at all. And, and now, I've, you know, people are going to defend her. So, good, defend her. Uh, I see what it says, selfish. Uh, maybe that's about Don. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it is. if it's about Don, I agree with you 100%. He is selfish. But more important than that, uh, the guy is an abuser. And I'm talking to one of his survivors. So, Mary, let's, let, let me get refocused again for you, for me and for you, and I apologize for that. I apologize on behalf of Soldier Girl, okay? that these are the kind of craziness that should not be happen, happening in this case, okay? And, you're, and you've been putting up with it a lot, so I'm going to listen to you. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I just want to put out there the, um, you know, I filed a report back in 19, I think, I believe it was 79 or 80 when this happened to me. Um, the night that this happened to me. My brother came home with my boyfriend. They put me in the car, drove, we drove actually to Chris and Mitch Burius's house. They opened the door. My brother and boyfriend both walked in, beat, him, beat the crap out of both of them. We got back in the car and they immediately took me to the Roy City Police Department. So I filed this report back then. But a couple of days later, my dad made me go back in and drop all the charges. You know, so that wasn't my, that was not my doing. I never wanted the charges to be dropped. But back then, I was only 13, 14 years old. I didn't have a choice, you know. 
I was under my mom and dad's roof. And so I had to drop them charges, you know, and now that all this has came out and everything, I mean, I've always wanted to go back in and press charges against him for doing that to me. Uh, I never could because I was always, you know, it was always in the back of my mind. So, that's fine. Um, but yeah, it was always in the back of my mind and, and, you know, and I just went on with my life and, and so, yeah, you know, I just, um, so I've always wanted to go back in and press charges. So, You chose this case that I think people need to understand, and, and it's important to re-remind re everybody that you, you and Jeannie came forward. Actually, it was Tris who came forward to, and, and put it out there, and you were right there with her. And not because you were trying to say, hey, you know, I've forgotten about this, but more importantly... And and correct correct me if I'm wrong. You have the had the courage to come forward and say, "Look, this happened to me." Okay. And what was your motivation with that? I I know what it is, but tell the world, you know, because you're one strong lady, and so is your sister. Uh, but tell the world, tell the world. Well, you know, when when me and Jeannie first heard that Summer went missing, I mean, it was, we just really thought that everybody should know about this, you know? And um, because of the stuff that happened, you know, with his, his two older kids, you know? I mean, he can sit there and say that his two older kids were, never neglected or anything and never lived in the filth that they lived in. But I was there, you know, I know what happened to them two kids. And so, you know, he can say all he wants that it didn't happen, but it did because I was there. I seen it with my own two eyes, you know, and he just needs to realize that, me and Jeannie and Trish coming forward with all this, that he needs to, in my opinion, he's 56 years old. He needs to start standing up for his responsibilities and quit blaming for everybody else for all his problems. He just, he needs to, you know? What, um, what um, have you heard? You said you heard some things on some um, some other uh, platforms out there. Uh, what are some of the things that um, you, you've you've been listening to? That, quite frankly, if there was anything that you've heard about uh, him taking responsibility, what what's true and what's not true? Um, uh, let's, let's, let's get that out there. Get and, out there. and by the and, way, and by the way, if soldier girl, I apologize to you if that was a misunderstanding, I'm seeing the note here. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought it was something else and I jumped to a conclusion. So, uh, forgive me. I, I did not, um, I didn't understand exactly, uh, where you were going with that. So, um, I'm sorry. Uh, but Mary, so I think you're one strong person and you've heard, you've endured a tremendous amount over the last um, you know, couple of weeks, quite frankly. Right. And, but what are some other things that uh, you talked to me earlier about that uh, maybe there's some 
other things that are being said that just aren't truthful. With that, you know, a couple of days ago when I heard him on that other YouTube channel and um, he had brought my ex-husband into it. And I don't know why he's doing this, but he's like, oh, well, Russ raped my sister. There needs to be charges against him. <laughs> that is totally not true, okay? Um, me and my ex-husband, we were boyfriend and girlfriend back in our teenage years. And we had split up for a couple of weeks. Well, during that couple of weeks that we split up, he started seeing and they dated for a couple of weeks and then that kind of went sour and that's all there was to that. There was, there was no rape involved in that. It was just, they decided they wanted to get together for a couple of weeks and that's what happened. And then they split up and then me and my ex-husband got back together again and you know, had kids like six years later and had a family and and uh you know that's what happened there and and donnie's sister even even came over to my house um back in the 90s and she wanted to apologize to me for doing what she did to me back then because we were really close you know we were really close sisters back then until all that happened but you know there was no rape involved in that it was just you know things that happened when you're dating and you know they got together and for a couple of weeks and that was that so you know i have no idea why donnie even said that but you know i just wanted to clear that up so How many women have come forward now? You oh, I'm How sorry, many? Chris. I couldn't hear you. Oh, that's okay. My bad. Uh, I, I'm two yeah, for two here. I, I, can't hear, I, I, I threw hear poor Chris. soldier. I'm sorry. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? No, I'm batting a thousand. I can't hear you, Chris. Okay, hang on. I, I'm batting a thousand here, kiddo. I I threw poor soldier girl. You know, my I'm, the next thing that will happen is Karen will come up here and knock me in the head and say, "Listen, you know, knock it off." Sorry. Okay. Hang on for a minute. How many women have come forward now? Can you can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Mary, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, go out and then come back. There you go. Okay, I think she just went off. Um let's let's uh wait for her uh everybody can you guys uh hear that i think she's in the wind or something on the other side there and 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 soldier girl i i gotta be on i feel horrible now i really do forgive me i'm i'm so sorry i did not mean to you know go there it's interesting though because you know like you guys out there i'm just so um engaged with these these uh victims here they're they're such good they're people such good can you people. can you hear me can you hear me okay sorry okay, sorry how many how women many have women come, have forward, come now? forward now i believe six 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 wow wow yeah yeah. 
how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, it just really hurts me when my mom and dad call me because they're so upset when I talk to them and, you know, they just, they wish that Donnie would quit calling them. I mean, my dad's ready to change his phone. He, I mean, he wants Donnie to call him. He wants to talk to Donnie, but he don't want to hear Donnie, you know, complaining to him or whatever Donnie's doing, you know, when he calls him. And, you know, yeah, of course my dad wants to talk to him, but my dad wants to talk to him and say, hi, how you doing? And shoot the breeze with him. He don't want to talk to Donnie and have Donnie complaining about me and Jeannie, you know, and what he thinks we're doing to him. You know, it wasn't us who started all this. It was Donnie, you know, and um, that prank that they pulled on me last week or two weeks ago or however long it was, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I can't tell Donnie because I can't talk to him. But I did go to a lawyer. So, and I've got that in the works right now, too. So, and this is more than just, um, this is going to be more than just a civil suit. I can tell you that much right now because from other things that I've heard from other YouTubers, and I've got that on tape, too, that this was premeditated, okay, intended to come after me and hurt me. So this is going to be a little bit more than just a civil suit. So just so you know, Donnie, I'm, I've already talked to a lawyer and things are in motion. Good for you, Mary. Good for keep, you, Mary. Keep strong and empower yourself. Keep going. You don't, don't, you know, re remember the story I told about the, the rock across the canyon, right? And about climbing it and getting to the top, okay? You are a survivor, and you have almost 10,000 people here in the chat cheering you and Jeannie on. And you don't look behind you. Stay strong. Keep pressing forward with what you feel makes the most sense for your life. Who cares what YouTube thinks about it, right? Other than our folks over here. Because I personally think the people that come to this channel are amazing human beings. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty protective and, you know, poor... You know, as you saw me five minutes ago, I went, wait a minute, okay, you know, who, who's going where here and what's the reason behind it? And, and, but this is the passion that these folks are rooting for you because I think there's a piece of this, and you and I have had a great conversation about this, that you feel, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but tell everybody what your thoughts are about as as this continues to go forward how you think it may impact summer well i mean i'm really hoping that you know somebody comes forward you know and lets everybody know that what happened to her, you know i'm that's that's been my whole from the very first start you know, and that's another thing. That's why, that's why I started recording Donnie was because I thought that, well, well, deep down I do. I, I mean, it's, it's just my opinion, but just like everybody else's, I really do think that he had something to do with her disappearance. I think they both know where she's at. I mean, you know. Why aren't they putting the effort out there to go look for her? Why? Because they know where she is. That's, but that's just my opinion. But, you know, ever since all this came out and stuff, I just, that's, 
been my whole my whole thing is to find summer and so when i started recording him i thought well you know what you know we were close once you know and maybe he would start confiding in me and and maybe let me know you know what happened but that never happened all he was set on was <laughs> I earn a private investigator to try and trick me <laughs> or something. You know, why wouldn't you hire an, a private investigator to find your little girl who's missing? You know, that's what I would be spending my money on. And if it was my little girl missing, I probably would have turned my whole entire house, that whole mountain into a command center to find my daughter, you know. but. That's just me. I don't I don't know. So, but yeah, this whole thing has just been for summer. And and I and, think and for, I the think record, for the record, right? Right. Yes. Yes. You you, you had already you started had already started recording Donnie before you ever even spoke to me. Yeah, I had already had oh four or five phone calls already recorded before I even before I even got a hold of you, Chris. So and and that's another thing. It was me that got a hold of you, you know? Wasn't yeah. you getting a hold of me? And I thought, and you, I were thought you were brilliant. When yeah. you called when you me. Called me. Uh, uh, because the first because thing, the I, first said, thing I, said, I said have you recorded him? Have you recorded him? him? And, you, and said, you said oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And, and, and we haven't and even, we played, haven't any even played any of those any calls. Of those There's, calls. 12, There's of 12 of them. Yeah. And yeah. I see, and I see uh, uh, Ms. Deer, she, she goes, Mary is, Mary is wicked smart. smart. That's, must <laughs> that must be from Boston. <laughs> Good for her. Good for her. Good thank for you for sharing, sharing that. that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so what so else? What else is going on? What else is going on? Um, well, you know, and there are some other things I wanted to put out there. I just, um, <sighs> this stuff with Donnie calling my mom and dad, it's just, it's really got me upset because, you know, they call me and I think Donnie knows that. And so I think Donnie is what Donnie's trying to do is to try and convince my mom and dad that me and my sisters are you know, uh, against him and, and we're the bad guys and we're the one do ones doing all this stuff, you know, and it's just, it's just not true, you know, and the reason why we're coming on, the reason why we do do these interviews, which we've only done, Jeannie's done one and I think Trish has done one and I think I've done well, I think this is my third one, maybe my fourth. But the only reason why I'm coming on these is because it's after Donnie goes on his. And I just, I really feel like I need to defend our family and stuff because of the way he's talking about us. And, you know, and I mean, I guess I shouldn't feel that I need to defend my family, but I love my family, you know. And it seems like that's the only way I can try to get the point across at least to Donnie, you know? So. Yeah. So, yeah, so just one of the things that's happening here and, um, well, first of all, I, I want to always tell you how proud I am of every one of you. You are amazingly strong women. I, and, and you, I mean, we've talked about it where I can't imagine what you have experienced um and and so i i i my mind my my heart just says okay what what's the piece that i can help them uh help you get to that next step to where you can start realizing that what you're doing is breaking a cycle of probably generations on you know, with inside of your family, right? Yes. And Chris, and, it, Chris it, it goes back. 
I'm talking generations in our county. Yes, at least five generations, it goes back. Yes, it's terrible to say, but it is. You know, and I'll bet you 10 to one, it happens in at least 90, 80, 90% of families, this happens, you know? People just don't come out and say it. They don't come out with it because they don't want to talk about it. They don't, they feel shameful. They feel like it's their fault that what happened, it's their fault. And, you know, that's a lot of the reason why people don't come out with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Part of that, part of that is his makeup of manipulation for him, but he's just, he's just right out of the mold on all of these guys uh, who, you know, cowardly use their power uh, and violence over women. And I've been a firm defender uh, of many survivors for a very, very, very long time. And now I, I just won't stop. I mean, it was, I, you know, maybe it's, you know, part of my personality, my sweet, my sweetheart will tell you that I just, I just won't let go. And at the same time, you know, if you look back at what you, one day you're going to look back and see what you're doing and you're going to look over at your grandchildren, which I know you're already, you have, okay? And your great-grandma, or not great-grandma, but your amazing grandma, okay? I, I know you're only 22 at the same time, so I got to be careful with that. Um, but one day, soon, you're going to see what you just said come to pass in terms of the success of the cycle being broken for now for generations going forward and i i cannot say enough of about how proud the world is of you uh, for not saying not staying silent any longer what what would you tell other you know women who have been in your position and then you got the courage to to make a change well i would just say you know i know it's hard you know when like reliving the memories of what happened to you but the more you come out and the more you get it out of your system the more you tell your story and let you know let everybody know it's like it's like this big weight that has been lifted off your shoulders, you know? And so I would suggest, you know, anybody go in and, you know, do something about it. Let somebody know what happened to you. Even if you just talk to somebody about it, you know, you don't have to press charges against them or whatever. It's just, it's, when you finally get this out after all the years, it's it's just such a relief, you know, and I would encourage anybody to do that. Even even men, you know, who have been who have been, you know, sexually assaulted. It's it's a real shameful thing, but the thing of it is, when you're in when you've been essayed, it's like you lock it up inside your body and you don't you don't tell anybody about it. You know, and I really do think that people need to let other people know what happened, you know, even if it is just talking to a friend or, or a sister or a sibling or whatever, you know, get it out, let them know, you know, and I can guarantee you, you will feel so much better about yourself, you know, and not have so much guilt. That's another thing. There's so much guilt that's built up over years. And it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, and that's yeah, and one that's of their one of their, their biggest tools for manipulation, for um, 
guys like this is, you know, as you're seeing, and fortunately behind the scenes, we've been able to talk and kind of walk through a couple of things that we felt were going to be coming. And sure enough, boy, was he, was he right on target? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. And, yeah. And so that's part of the triangulation aspect of now him calling your mom, your dad, and, and, and for our, everybody around the world, by the way, I just love reading some of these chats. I can't catch them all because uh, I'm just not that fast at catching them, but uh, the ones that we can, I'm trying to put them up here for you. Uh, I mean, there's folks that are, you know, saying, hey, if you, if you start, a, if you create a GoFundMe, you know, for you and for Jeannie, for any type of potential legal uh, fees or anything like that, just let us know. Uh, and we'll, w- the other night uh, for the Miliette family, uh, this, these, this group of pe- of of subscribers and friends and just friends of you and friends of our channel, uh, you know, they raised a dollar per person. We, we, a dollar, uh, they raised over $10,000 in two hours, uh, to keep the Miliete, uh, family in the search efforts for Maya. Uh, the, the, I mean, you can, that is love, uh, in its purest form. And, you know, so if you guys get to that place where you get, you know, in, into a into a, a money bind or something like that, don't be afraid to say, hey, I can just call me and, uh, you know, we'll we'll do it. Not that you not that you not need that it. You I'm, need just it. Saying. I'm just saying. OK, okay. Um, um, so so how how emotionally emotionally. What are you doing to keep keep moving moving forward? forward? Well, right now, I mean, emotionally for me, I just keep thinking that, you know, that this is, this will come to an end, you know, this will, this will be over with, you know, but in the meantime, I mean, I just try to keep myself busy and, and, you know, and, try to move forward you know i i keep feeling like this is the best thing to do right now you know and so i have to keep reminding myself that this is the best thing to be doing right now because you know i mean i care about donnie okay i don't hate him you know i've never hated him even after everything he's done to me and Jeannie and, and all the lies and, you know, everything that's been going on the last couple of months, you know, I don't hate him. You know, I, I kind of feel sorry for him, you know, but, you know, I keep having, having to remind myself that I do, I have to go forward and just stay strong for myself. As a friend, friend. I would, and we've talked about this, but I really want to see you, um, you know, kind of when you get to that place internally, I I want to see you get some counseling. Okay. And, you know, that's on your time, obviously every, every, all of this is, is on your time. Not what, not what I say or anybody else in the world. This is. This is for you, about you, when you're ready. And I know the other night when I was talking to Jeannie, um, you know, she she just cannot believe how many people uh, have felt that uh, she's inspired. And you're the same way. Your humility, and, and yet I understand what you say, you know, he's, I still care for him. Uh, what's the old saying? You hate, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah. But I also, but know, I also know that you, you share with me many times that what he did to you. I mean, how many years ago was that? that? Oh my gosh. It's been what? 40 about 42 years ago, 43 years ago. 
and and he comes up and he talks about Jeannie ruining a relationship with some girl that he had or something to that effect. I heard that the other night. That, tell us about that. And how old was he and how old was she? Right. Well, I kind of had to laugh about that because as far as I remember, when Donnie was in Texas, he was 19 years old. That would have made Jeannie 12. You know, and he's sitting there saying, he goes on live broadcast, <laughs> tells everybody that Jeannie broke up his relationship with some girl when he was in Texas. That's pretty funny. Hmm, you were 19 years old and she was 12. Right there, he admits <laughs> to it, you know, doing, doing stuff to her when she was 12 years old and he was 19. <laughs> So you need to, I don't know, like I said, uh, he won't shut his mouth to save his life. He just keeps talking and talking and talking. And, but that's okay. Cause the more he talks, the more he gets in trouble. So. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, L, and, and, L, and Ellie is monitoring everything that he does on YouTube, everything. Uh, he even texted me the other night, tried to get me to call him, and uh, I'm not, homie, don't play that. But he is the gift that keeps on giving. I, I, I agree with you 100% there. Um, you know, uh, I see, you know, folks are saying, Chatty Cathy, even, oh, and all he does is, he's just, he's just, you know, if, I, I love where he says, you know, what does this have to do with summer? What does this have to do with summer? Well, it here's a here's a question okay what doesn't it have to do with summer i'm going to start asking that question what doesn't it have to do with summer right because you're right because if you know if he was doing this stuff to my sister when she was five years old lord only knows what was going on with summer you know and um, I'm not saying there was anything going on with them, but it's pretty suspicious, you know, and so I don't know. And there was even stuff that I seen today on another YouTube channel that somebody put out like a day or two ago. And apparently it was supposedly supposed to be H's sister talking to somebody. And she was saying that. Donnie used to take showers with Summer. It's like, wow, that's just totally unreal. Now, I don't know if that was true or not, but, you know, it's been put out there. So, you know. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll let that. We'll let that. With, with stuff like that, you know, we, we want to hear it directly from him or something, right? I mean, we don't want to kind of guess on that stuff. I mean, w because we don't know. Okay, we don't know. Now, what we do know is, you know, for over five years, Summer slept uh, with in the parents' bed every single night. And one of the last memories he had was skin-to-skin -skin contact um, that day before or he, he, he left for work or that whatever the reality is going to be yeah yeah you know and and i was you know i was just putting out there you know just what i read you know i'm not saying that that was true because i have no no clue who it was from or anything you know the youtube channel or anything like that but you know there is there's just there's so much stuff that's coming out you know and people are coming forward and you know i I wish I, I knew if it was true or not. There's so many rumors going on out there. It's just terrible, you know? Yeah, what, what, you, what do you think happened to Summer? What, what's your perspective? Because you've talked to him so many times, you, and you guys were pretty close before, obviously, the assault occurred up until that point, because you're, you're, you guys are the same age, right? Yes. Yeah, we're only about a month and maybe six days apart, I think. And 
I was born first, but um, yeah, we were really close in age. We went to school, you know, in the same classes and stuff like that. And uh, um, so, yeah, we were really close when we were younger, you know, and, and um, so I just, you know, I, I thought maybe by getting, you know, talking to Donnie, you know, I thought maybe he would put his trust in me, you know, and let me know what happened because I feel like he does know what happened, but, you know, and this is just my speculation. I can speculate just like everybody else. You know, I don't know what happened. I was not there. I just really feel like Donnie was laying in wait in the basement and waiting for her. And I think she went down to play with her toys. The boys didn't know they had their faces glued to the computer. They were playing games. Kids do that. There could be a bomb going off right next to them and they would have no idea. They're so engrossed in their games. And I just really feel like he took her out that door and ran her down that trail. And I think he had maybe the car or whatever parked next to that shed and I think he took her there and, and took off and went and dumped her somewhere, went and buried her somewhere. And, and I think that's when he got the call from Candace. She's like, you know, summer's missing. But that's my speculation. You know, a lot of people have other, other ideas of what happened to her. That's just mine. You know, I'm not saying it happened. I just, that's just my speculation. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And you come from a different perspective than anybody else because you've known him for all your life. I mean, pretty much, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, I don't know. So I have a question for you, Mary. So, you know, and some of those other things that are coming out could very well you know, they could fall into place, right, at some point. I mean, but at this point, you know, they're coming from, you know, reliable sources. But at the same time, you know, I help everybody understand really what Donnie was like in his criminal activity. Uh, now, outside of the SA, I mean, this guy was quite a character if, I were, if I've done my homework correctly. Yeah, yeah, you know, Donnie, Donnie started young, 13, 14, 15 years old, he was getting in trouble all the time, constantly, um, I believe it started out with um, just robbing little places, you know, like little convenience stores and stuff like that, and trying to get money for drugs, and I don't know if it was the people that he got messed up with because you know back then i mean we hung out with basically the same people but then he started hanging out with people we didn't even know you know and so he started getting in trouble and um just started doing drugs really bad and and um was he chasing was he the needle, chasing the needle? Yes, he was. I mean, for instance, there was one time that he had broke into the veterinary's office just right up the road from my mom and dad's house. And he broke into their cabinet and started shooting up all kinds of dog drugs or animal drugs that I don't even think he even knew what they were. He was just out for drugs, you know, and always coming home with tracks up and down his arms and his legs and it was really bad you know he was always going around to all the houses uh, everybody he knew uh my mom and dad you know he robbed them blind numerous times um he would he went to my uh, brother's house and stole his lawnmower he tried coming to mine and my ex-husband's house he tried stealing our lawnmower but my husband was ready for him because he, we knew he was going around to everybody's house and the family still in their lawnmowers and stuff. So we had set up a trap for him one night 
um, with mason jars and fishing line. And we uh, put the fishing line all around the bottles and around the lawnmower. So when he came into the underneath, you know, the awning to grab our lawnmower, all the bottles came crashing down. Well, he ended up taking off. So. You know, back in the, uh, you got to attend to your family that they're more important than, than this guy. Trust me. <laughs> now say that again. I said, I said, if you have to attend to your family, they're more important than this guy. That's for sure. So. Okay. He was just telling me that he was going to bed. So yeah, we're good. <laughs> okay, cool. Tell him, tell him, tell him, thank tell you for, thank sharing, you for your sharing your time. Yeah. He appreciates it. So one of the so one, one of the things I don't know if you remember, back in the day, vet offices were big targets because of fencyclidine, which is PCP. Oh, I didn't yeah, know it, that. It, see, I I didn't it's understand. A horse tranquilizer. Horse tranquilizer. Oh, see, I didn't understand why he would want to bust into a veterinary's office. I I had no clue back then. I was you know. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is See, one this of these, is things, one of these where things where you randomly just don't pick a veterinarian's office in your story if you weren't telling the truth, because that's a that's a, also another another big drug here. I see, you know, ketamine uh, is also coming across here as well. So thank you, uh, you know, for uh, telling us that, too, as well, folks. Uh, so, Mary, what? You know, you you kind of brushed over it, but he was doing armed robberies. Yes, he was. And that's why he went to jail and stuff and juvenile and everything, because, yes, he was. And he actually he actually took, I believe it was a nine millimeter from my dad's closet and used that. Yes. And then after he used it, he went and pawned it. It was like. A nine hundred dollar gun, and I believe he got a hundred and fifty dollars out of it. <laughs> yeah, so he's yeah he's been he's been in trouble with the law, you know, quite a bit. And uh, now what I about just, what about his runs, his to, runs Mexico to Mexico and Texas? Texas? Um, well, now a lot of things when he was in Texas. I never knew that he went to Mexico, though, but I mean, I guess he could have, but I never heard about that until he started talking about it just like a couple months ago. So. What about Texas? What about Texas? Um, well, I do know that when he was in Texas, my mom and dad had to go down there, um, I believe, to bail him out or something or talk to the judge and try to get the judge to let him go because they did. I think they came back with him. Sorry about that. No, you're no, fine. No, you're fine. <laughs> so, so, I have a question about, uh, and, and go ahead, take your husband's priority. Uh, trust me again. You know, I'm I'm just a pretzel boy out here, so. It, Let the dog out. He, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's all good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, um. <laughs> So, let how bad has when Donnie kept, when Donnie would go into prison and he come home and he get out or go back, he he said that you guys made a lot of phone calls to his probation and parole officers. Help the world understand what those dynamics are in relationship to that's not reality. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, we never did call his probation officer or anything like that on him. I don't know why he's saying that, but that never happened. As far as I know, that never happened. Well, for one thing, he was never out of prison or jail long enough for us to call his parole officer. I mean, he would get out of prison and he would come and, of course, he had nowhere else to go. So he would go to my mom's. And um, he would be out for maybe a week, and then all of a sudden he would take off and he'd be gone. And nobody would see him until we got a phone call that he was in jail again. You know, so that's what happened there. I mean, and that happened all the time. You know, I mean, he'd go to jail or prison and get out and... He'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm all rehabilitated. And, and he would start talking about doing the church thing. But he'd be out not less than a week, and he'd be right back into drugs again. Right back stealing again, everything. So, you know, and the only time I would see him is when he would come to my mom's to rip them off or steal something. So two questions. Do you know who owns the Subaru and who it's registered to? I don't, but is what I was trying to get across to everybody, you know, myself, I don't think Donnie has the credit to get a car like that. And if it's in anybody's name, it's in my dad's because... Or maybe his sisters, because they're the only two that I know of that had that would have the credit and that would help him get that car. You know what I mean? So if it if it's in anybody's name, I believe it would be in my dad's. Okay. Okay. The second one is your dad is advancing in Alzheimer's, and I know you and your dad are really, really close. But how much has, now this is Donnie's biological father, right? Okay. Okay. But yes. you call but him you dad. But you call him dad. He's, he was more of a dad to me than my real dad. You know, I mean, I love my real dad with all my heart. But when my stepdad came into the picture, he just pretty much took over and he was just, He's, he's been the most awesome father that, you know, anybody could ask for. And we are, we're really close. I mean, I go over there and, you know, he calls me his baby girl, you know, and um, we are, we're really close. I mean, we're, it's almost like he's my bi biological dad, you know. So that said, your dad's been protecting him for a very very long time and why do you think that why do you think that is well i think that is is because well actually i talked to my dad just a little while ago you know and and he was telling me i said well i don't understand why donnie's you know because donnie blames my dad for a lot of things, you know, he's a, he always has. He's always blamed my dad for his problems or for him getting, every time he's he's gotten in trouble, he blames my dad for it. Well, I was asking my dad the other day, I'm, I was like, well, why is he doing that? And he said, well, he thinks that I threw him away. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, when me and his mom got a divorce, you know, his mom took the kids. I believe Donnie was only like five, five or six years old when they got a divorce. And his mom took all three of the kids, okay? And Donnie didn't join my mom and dad until he was 12 years old. You know, he came in and because he, at 12 years old back then, he was old enough to say who he wanted to live with. 
and he didn't want to live with his mom anymore after all them years and i don't blame him because his stepdad was mean he was one of the meanest guys i think i've ever met in my entire life you know and i felt really bad for donnie and his sisters having to live there that's you know, kelly that's kelly yeah, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't Donnie's decision to marry Kelly, you know, for his mom to marry him, you know, and it wasn't Donnie's decision for his mom to take all three kids, but there was no way that she was going to let my dad have them kids, you know, she took them. It wasn't my dad's fault. My dad did not throw him away like he thinks, you know. My dad had no choice. My dad wanted his kids, but he had no choice. It was a court ruling that Karen had the kids. And when Donnie turned 12 years old, then Donnie was like, well, I want to live with my dad. So that's what happened. You know, they went to court and everything, and that my dad got Donnie. And so, you know, I think... I think the reason why my dad has been protecting him all these years is because I think Donnie throws that in his face or something. You know, he makes my dad feel guilty. And my dad has been there for him from day one, from the very first day that he ever got in trouble or done anything wrong or anything. My dad has been right there every time for him. And I, you know, of course, it's his, it was on his own biological son. And I think that has a lot to do with it, too, you know. And maybe my dad does feel guilty, but I think a lot of that guilt comes from Donnie putting it on him. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Well, what about this question here? What's the longest time frame Donnie has ever been clean, if any, if you know? Oh my gosh, probably maybe six months. Yeah. Was that, was after, that prison? after prison? Um, I think that was when he started having his kids. When he first started having little Donnie and his daughter Margie. I think he tried cleaning up for a while. And he would go, you know, he would go for a while, but then he would just get right back into it. You know? And at that, and time, at that, at time, that, time, at that time, what, that was, time, his what was his drug of choice? choice? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what it was, but I do remember one time he came over to my house and, you know, they were always coming over after me and my ex-husband bought our first house because he was helping him do the drywall. We were remodeling and Donnie came over and was helping him and we didn't mind that because Donnie wasn't on the drugs then, you know, and my husband was paying him for the job and everything. And then, so they kept coming over, you know, probably within, it was about a six month period while we were redoing our front room and kitchen. And so they kept coming over and visiting and they came over one time and Donnie went straight to my bathroom. And um, he went in, shut the door, and he was in there for like 20, 30 minutes. And I was looking at his ex-wife, Pam, and I'm like, is he okay? And she's like, yeah, he's fine. He's just going to be in there a while. And I'm like, is he sick? What's going on? And she goes, oh, he's in there shooting up. And I was like, oh, my God, I freaked out, you know, because I've got kids of my own, and they were little then. They were only like four and five years old at that time. And so I was freaking out, and I'm like, oh, my God. I, It's like, no, 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 get him out of here. Get him out of there. And, and I was banging on the bathroom door and yelling, and I'm like, Donnie, get out of there, because he had locked himself in the bathroom. And... Pam come up to me and she goes, you're just going to have to wait. He's not coming out till he's done. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And she goes, well, when he shoots up, he gets sick. So he has to get sick and he has to be in there for a while, be by himself for a while. I'm like, oh. 
And I didn't know that that's what was going on. And when he came out of that bathroom, I immediately, I said, you get out of my house and don't you ever, ever, ever come back again. You know, that was terrible. I can't believe that he even did that, did that to me, you know, in my own house. I, yeah, that's, that was terrible. Yeah. He's chasing the, right. Every four to six hours. Um, you know, that's why methadone was such a, when it came through what they called the juice program back in the day and used to go down to the methadone clinics and show your card and, the plasma life for methadone is 24 hours, whereas, you know, synthetic drugs like, you know, heroin or, excuse me, like, you know, street drugs like heroin, black tar, uh, obviously, in, you know, in San Diego, we, we'd get we'd get the purest, you know, coming straight across the border there. And, you know, the, these folks are just, you know, they're stuck on it. And every four to six hours, they're slamming and, you know, chasing the, chasing the needle. So... Uh, is that what you thought? Uh, yeah, yeah, chasing the dragon, exactly. Is that what you thought was going on, or did you have any evidence of that other than, you know, did he come out? Was he was he under the influence, if you remember? Well, um, I know that he was shooting up a lot of heroin because I had talked to him about it before, you know, and he was telling me his experiences with it. And he even told me, he said, Mary, the first time I ever did heroin, he said it was like such a, a, a nice high, I guess, or whatever. The, he said after that first time, he just, he had to keep going back, you know, and I was like, wow, that just doing it one time got you hooked. And he's like, yes, he said that it was a very powerful drug. You know, and I was like, God, well, I'm sure I'm glad I've never tried it because I wouldn't even want to be there. You know, that's, yeah, I would never do that. That's. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, obviously some folks that get into that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues uh, around it. And they're good people uh, that do, you know, things just to keep, just to stay alive. I mean, the, you know, they, they can, they really, you know, go through some pretty horrific, uh, you know, shakes and, you know, sweat and pain and muscle cramps, et cetera. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things when they start coming down on that, but, you know, believe it or not, folks, you know, they think you can die from a, from a heroin, you know, withdrawals, but actually you can drive, die from DTs. Uh, heroin draws, that's why they used to call it going cold turkey. You know, just kind of throw them into a room and, you know, you let them sit there and, you know, you monitor them. But methadone helps them come down a little bit easier. But methadone is a much more difficult drug to come off of because it's synthetic than, believe it or not, street street heroin. Do you know if he ever sold uh, narcotics or anything like that, to your knowledge? Um, No. Not that I know. I I don't think he did, because he was always he was always after money. You know, he could never hold a job, and if he did get a job, you know, back then it was only just for like a month or or so, because he was always right back into the drugs. You know, and his hoarding his habit, he would always go around to the family and steal things from us. That's how he would support his habit, you know? And I think my mom and dad kind of turned a blind eye to it for a long time there because they just knew that it was going to happen as soon as Donnie got out of jail or prison. They knew he was going to steal from them. So after a while, they finally just had to start hiding things and putting things in a, in a, um, a vault, you know, so he wouldn't get to them because, you know, I mean, he, he stole their wedding rings, you know, they were on the bathroom sink and he actually stole their wedding rings. I mean, that's, 
that's pretty bad into drugs when you have to steal your own mom and dad's wedding rings for to get your fix. Well, you know, well, and share with everybody uh, the sign on the street corner with the baby story. Um, well, he, you know, when he, he ended up, he was trying to sell his son and because, um, his ex-wife had came in the house. It was late at night. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And she came in, she was crying. She said she just picked up little Donnie off 25th street in Ogden, and I don't know if you've been on 25th Street in Ogden or not before, but that used to be a pretty bad place, like back in the 30s and 40s, you know, it was a pretty bad place, and and even back in the 70s and 80s, it, was, it wasn't it was a good place to be, but Donnie had taken off with his oldest son, and his ex-wife knew, she knew he was going to be down on 25th looking for drugs, and she had to go find him because he had their son, you know, and she found him and he was standing there on the corner trying to sell his son for drugs or for money. He, he, because he needed to get his fix, you know, he needed money and that's all that mattered to him. You know, he didn't care, you know, where he got the money, how he got the money, just as long as he got the money. And so, go ahead. Now, who was there when he came back, if you remember? From, you mean from selling, trying to sell his oldest son? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember it was me and Jeannie, and I think Trish was there. My mom and dad was there. It was late at night. We were getting ready to go to bed, and she came in, and she said Donnie just tried. She caught Donnie trying to sell little Donnie, and she was crying. She said she didn't know what she was going to do. She said she just left Donnie there you know, her husband, she said she just left him there and grabbed little Donnie and came, came direct, directly to my mom's because she didn't know what to do. And you were there. And you were there. Yes. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. And so, you know, Donnie can say all he wants. I didn't try selling my kids. I didn't try selling my kid. Yes, he did. Unless his wife was lying. You know, I, I guess she could have been lying, but I don't think she was. Did you see the Did baby? Did you see the baby? Yeah, yeah. She had both the kids. Uh, Margie was just a, probably about six months old, and little Donnie, I believe, was about two. So, yeah. yeah. And that was another that was reason another you, reason came, you forward, came forward, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the re another reason why I came forward. And, you know, Donnie has it kind of mixed up because when I was doing that interview with Teresa, one of them interviews, I was telling everybody about the time that me and it was me and my husband, my ex-husband, we were trying to adopt little Margie, his oldest daughter. And she was only, then she, I believe she was maybe four or five years old about that time. And um, Donnie wasn't working. He was on drugs. They needed money to pay their rent. Um, and we just did not agree with the way they were raising them kids. And so we talked about it. And I, I asked my husband, I said, well, what would you think about us adopting Margie? And he's, we talked about it and he said, yeah, we could do that. He said, you know, we can't adopt them both, but if we're going to adopt one, let's adopt Margie. And I said, okay. And they had came over. We talked about it. We got all the adoption papers in order. We had them at our house and to, to convince them 
to adopt Margie, we did. We offered them $10,000 because we knew they needed money, you know, and we just wanted a safe place for Margie, you know. And so they had came over to sign the papers and we started talking with Pam and Pam goes, I mean, she had the pen in her hand waiting to sign them papers. And she goes, now, before I sign these, um, I just want to make sure that, you know, that we can come over and see her and, and take her to places when we want and come over anytime and take her and still see her. And, and I told her, I said, no, Pam, no. If we adopt her, she is going to be our little girl. We, you cannot have any contact with her at all because we didn't want them having contact with her. And right then and there, she's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And Donnie, they argued about it. Donnie was ready. All Donnie was, he was kept saying, just, just sign it, just sign it so we can get the money and get out of here. Just do it. And Pam was like, no, I'm not going to do it. So that didn't, so it, it all fell through. Now, I want to clarify for everybody, all that you're sharing with me and the world here, just for the record, everybody, Mary has shared with me in the past, and she has not missed a beat in her truthfulness about these stories. So uh, everything that you're hearing here, I've heard, you know, already, uh, you know, a while ago, uh, but she felt comfortable enough now to kind of, you know, elaborate a little bit deeper in what she's talking about here. So imagine you come up, you know, selling his, his you know, uh, little Johnny. And how old was he at the, uh, about that time, if you remember? Um. I believe it would have had to have been around 1988 or so, maybe 89. So not really quite sure how old he would have been at that time. Because I believe little Donnie was born the same year my son was, which was in 86. So it would have had to have been about 88 or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that just goes to show your heart too. I mean, you're seeing what's going on with the dynamics of, you know, with inside of that family dynamic. And, and I, I think you, you obviously, you know about the drug problems going on with both sides of them. I mean, just right. I mean, both, both Pam, both and, Pam and Donna, Donna, at the time. Donna at the time. Yeah. Pretty spun, pretty know, spun out. Yeah. And, and Donnie, you know, and that Pam was like on meth and stuff, but I don't think she was. I mean, her choice of drug was marijuana, you know, and, and, and I'm no saint, Chris. I, I smoke weed. I, I still smoke weed, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I tell the doctors that when I go to the doctors, you know, I'm, I'm no saint myself. Okay. But you know, and that's another, another thing. Every time, you know, Pam and Donnie came over, you know, yeah, I believe they came, I believe Pam came, at least came over quite a bit to visit me because I would always smoke with her, you know, and they never had any money. But her, as far as I know, her choice of drug was marijuana. I never, ever once seen her do any meth or or even act like she was always on meth or anything. She was always just kind of normal and, you know, hi, how you doing type of a, a girl, you know? So. Well, if it make you feel any better, the world today uh, all smokes marijuana. So uh, you're in great company with about probably 3 billion people. <laughs> if if that's the worst of it, Mayor, we love you even more. I, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, I just, I'm being truthful, you know, and, 
And there's no reason for me to come on and lie about things that Donnie's done or what's happened in the past. There's, you know, there's just, there's no reason for it, you know, and, and, you know, and that's another reason why I try to come on and let everybody know about stuff that Donnie's saying, because 90% of the stuff that he is saying is not true, you know, and so of course I'm going to come on and, and defend my family and, you know, let everybody know that, you know, what he's saying is just, just is not true. You know, and I just, I don't have the need. I don't know why I have the need to defend my family. But I don't know. <laughs> well, would you feel, well, would you feel comfortable if some folks asked you a couple of questions and as long as they're not crazy? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so uh, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute and I'll put some questions up. So uh, guys, if you have some questions here for Mary, um, let's keep them respect uh, respectful. Okay, here's the first one. Do you think he sold summer? Yeah, you know, I gosh with a lot of other stuff that's been coming out, my mind kind of wanders towards that, you know? It's very possible because of all the sex trafficking that I've heard that even just around his area, there's, you know, quite a bit. So he could have, you know? I just, I'm just not quite sure. So, so I'm going to answer, answer one. this one. He's trying to get to Mary by going through his parents, and the answer is he shouldn't be doing that um, at all, Court. Um, but, yes, that's what he's trying to do is he's trying to get to her, talk to her by reaching out to her father who is in advanced stages of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Here's one Here's from one Shannon. From Shannon. Would you consider adoption of the boys or summer now? Yes. If I was in a better position than I am now, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would do it so in a heartbeat. If I could take them boys and summer too, you betcha. I would do it in a heartbeat. For me. Yeah, for me. Can you see that? Can you one? see that one? You know if Margie is okay now. Um, you know, I haven't talked to Margie. It's been a couple of years since I've talked to her, but I hear that she's doing okay. 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 This one's for this me. one's for me. Do I think Summer's case will be solved? Yes. Where is Little, Where is Donnie, little today? Donnie today? Um, little Donnie lives in Ogden. He's married. Um, he's got two beautiful children. He's a very, very hard worker. Um, he's a very strong person. He's a very good person. Um, you know, he, he hates what's going on right now with all this. Um, he tries to keep to himself because he don't want to get involved with any of this. But he, he's a really good, he turned out to be a really good dad and father and and husband and he's doing great yeah but he got in but trouble. he got in trouble he did yep he did you know and when he got in trouble and and went to prison i thought oh my gosh he's just following in his dad's footsteps 
but he pulled himself out of that situation. And I am so proud of him for doing that. You know, it's, it's, I am so surprised that, that them two kids got out of their situation the way they did, you know, and the way they are today. I am so, I'm so proud of them, you know, and so, yeah, so what, little Donnie, what, he's doing great. What about this? What one? about this one? Where do you think the cycle of abuse started? For Donnie, I I really do think it was Kelly, his stepdad. I don't think Donnie wants to come out and talk about it. You know, because like I said, with men and boys, it's a lot shameful. More, I'm thinking, you know, than with, with girls or women. But... I just think Donnie don't want to come out and say what happened in that household with his stepdad. He has told me about his stepsisters being abused by his stepdad. And also his sisters have told me about being abused by him. So, you know, I'm thinking that's where Donnie got it from was his stepdad. Okay. So, uh, a little something about 99 pink balloons here. I love this picture because that is Leticia Hernandez. She is a little girl that was kidnapped December 16th, 1989. And I was involved in that case. Uh, that was my agency where she was abducted. Uh, now, here's the good news. We know who did it. Uh, we have some degraded DNA, uh, but it's getting, technology is getting better by the day. So she says, Mary, how do you keep your heart from getting cold and hateful? Teach us, teach me. I can't, I can't hear you, Chris. So the question is, I think your sound went off. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, we can hear you. Your your speaker. I'm gonna go out and come back in. Okay. No, it's your it's your speak. It. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go back out. Okay. While well, she goes out, uh, this little girl there, 99 pink balloons. Uh, you can go look her up. Just type in Leticia Hernandez, missing, kidnapped. Uh, it's December 16th, 1989. And um, that little girl, uh, we found her about a year and a half later, actually her remains. And I was actually the one who found her clothing, uh, some part, part parts of her clothing. Um, so, hey, you know, I should do I should do a show on that. Thank you, ninety nine. Appreciate that. So she wanted to know how you stay strong and not mean in your heart, teacher. You know, it's really hard. Um, I try to keep my composure with Donnie because, you know, I. It's really hard because he's my brother, you know? It's really hard um, not to have hate for him, you know? And like I say, I, I actually feel sorry for him, you know? And I try not to hate, you know? Because that's just, that's not me, you know? I'm, I, I can be kicked to the curb a thousand times and still find good in that person, you know, and so that's, you know, so in my mind, I mean, I, I stay strong for myself and my mind and, you know, and, and I, I try to keep my composure and, you know, and like I said, I, I, he's my brother. So I do have compassion for him, 
even though all the stuff that he's done to me, you know, I still have compassion for him, you know, so, and, and I just, I try not to hate because I don't like going there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're an extremely compassionate, strong woman who has raised successful children and I, I can say, I can that, say because that because my, my wife, wife did it, wife did it. Right. and and we were were very blessed. Uh, like you, you have a good husband who you know stands alongside you, and um, the fact that you're able to show that type of strength is is amazing. And I think you can see over here the world uh, just thinks you're amazing and. So I'm going to work to almost three almost hours three into hours this. So what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll have you back. You know me. Okay. Uh, but but what, what, what do you want to tell the world? Tell the world who's listening right who's now? Listening right now. Almost 10,000 people. 10, people. Well, I just want to let everybody know, you know, I talk to Jeannie pretty much almost every day and we both, and even Trish, we are all so amazed at everybody that has, you know, shown their love and everything for us. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. I mean, you know, a lot, I've got a lot of uh, messages and stuff, you know, and I, I read them. You know, I just want everybody to know that I read them and I, it makes me smile, you know, to know that there's that many people out there that are for us and are with us and, you know, and are, they say we're so strong and, and for doing what we're doing and coming forward. And it's, it really makes us, all three of us very, very happy. So, so let's put some let's put love some in the love chat in the here, chat for, these, here for, these. for Mary. For Mary, we're gonna call her gonna hashtag, call her proud, hashtag Mary. proud Mary. <laughs> okay, Mary. Okay, Mary. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me on. Uh, anytime, you anytime. know that, and you know you, you know, just call me. Just call me twenty four seven if you need it. Okay. Okay. I sure will. Okay. All right, kiddo. I'm going right, to let you go back to your husband and then husband. kind of wrap this up. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a little bit. Bye. Bye. Wow. Full evening, folks. We're so grateful for Mary and just her strength. I, I can't disagree with anybody out there that... Uh, just you know knows that how strong she's being here and the cycle of you know just craziness around this whole case uh, in terms of just how people are everybody is focused on summer and the the relevance here of her and Jeannie coming forward um, is so important to understand uh, ultimately because, you know, if we, again, we stay with our three theories, right? If it's, I, I'm, I'm not going to lean towards somebody coming right up into that house and snatching this child. Uh, I've said this, you know, over and over again, in my opinion, there's only one high risk offender in that geographic region within, um, I think it's a two mile distance for somebody to come that far. Um, and then the timing of it had to be perfect. Uh, the fact that we just realized recently, um, you know, some other moving parts and dynamics of now stories are coming out from people talking potentially that's even changing, you know, some of the things that, w that, um, you know, had been floating around there. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's just use the door for an example now, the basement door. Okay. It, you'll, I don't know if you guys caught it or not, but 
it, that is a one-way glass. Uh, it is a reflective one-way piece of glass. You can only see out. You cannot see in uh, on that door. And I think, you know, that's a huge, huge um, obstacle for the stranger abduction theory. The second uh, huge obstacle is just geographically. Uh, the, the suspect would have had to come up onto that property and then at some point had to realize that in their target acquisition, i.e. summer, she would have had to come out of that door or had to come out from the kitchen door to put herself into the environment whereby she would be observed and then kidnapped. Now, the other problem with that is the suspect is taking a huge risk coming up onto that property okay. for a couple of reasons. One is Don's truck, if he took that, if we're to believe that he took that Subaru and all the employees, you know, signed off on seeing him, well, that means the suspect who's coming up to snatch Summer sees Don's truck at home. Uh, that in of itself is very problematic for a stranger abduction. Um, and so that in of it, you know, we got we have to think about that at length and say, okay, well, what are the probabilities? Um, not the, you know, what are the probabilities of that? Not the possibilities, but what are the probabilities of that? Right. Well, the probabilities go very, very down. They, they go low. They go low. Okay. So then the next piece then is where, where are these dogs? What are these dogs doing that sent on summer? Where does the scent pick up? And if it's the, the strongest scent is out that door, but around up towards that swing. Okay. And that means in of itself, in of itself, that that's going to be the most natural place you're going to find that child sitting outside that door and then running to that tree to play on that swing because you have, you have parents who have described her habits. And not only that, have added a narrative into those habits that the boys were basically told, keep an eye on Summer, don't let her out of your sight. And then the explanations for that were the wild animals, the bears, and, you know, all the, all the stories that came along with that. Okay. So all of these dynamics have to be lined up almost like the universe is 100% on schedule that day with this offender taking such a high risk to come up on that property. And so you would have to have a lot of things fall into place uh, for that suspect to come up there and reasonably if there's a place of opportunity or target it would be out by that swing and i've and i've in my mind being there now and seeing it even further um, that in my mind would be the place what we call the contact site. I don't believe the contact site is in the basement in a stranger abduction theory. Okay. Um, I, I just don't see that happening. We'll find out, right? At some point, we'll find out. Now, 
the dogs then become do they become totally relevant or or is there a possibility that they're picking up her scent because some of those paths you hear Candace describe the boys riding the motorcycles down those paths and then you hear the dad describing that summer used to chase him on the motorcycle and you even see a video of one of the children on the motorcycle with summer taking off behind it when i was there it looked like those paths could be the same ones that the kids would ride the motorcycle down you can go down that hill to the road and come back up the driveway you can go down by the bus you can stay around the the outer perimeter of the house riding those motorcycles so is the scent summers yeah probably but now the circumstance becomes the question. Remember, it's environment, situation, circumstance for the victim continuum. So what are the potentials in that circumstance? Well, one of the potentials is, is clearly, you know, she could have wandered off down that path from the swing area. She could have... Uh, it could be old scent uh, in terms of always there uh, down to that road if she's chasing the motorcycles with the boys on her brothers. So then that takes us back to, you know, the, the other thought process here in relationship to is, could this be intentional or an accident? Um, and if it's an accident, what are the theory, what are the possibilities, right? Does she fall down those stairs? Uh, does, do one of the kid, one of the brothers, do they get into it? Uh, and there's an accident. Does the mom or dad uh, do something uh, inadvertently creates an accident? Okay. Is it a situation where, um, there's some inappropriate act, uh, behavior taking place and the poor child dies as a result of that. Do one of the parents have anger issues? Do both of them have anger issues? And they just go too far. And then of course, you know, she just walked away into the woods and she's in a holler somewhere. And then, of course, the worst of all of these is with drugs and all the activities going on in that area, is she uh, potentially trafficked or, and or um, given away for a better life or um, for the worst case scenario, what operation underground railroad is all about i don't know yet i'm i'm still not leaving the house yet still not leaving the house uh, in my mind um, and however if it is a random situation how that individual uh, got away with it then you know, I, I'd like to spend a, a week in that person's head because there's going to be a lot more victims than just Summer Wells. I can assure you of that. I can assure you of that. So, um, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up this evening. Um, I just want you guys to know right now, I'm, I, I am so grateful to each and every one of you uh, for being here, for subscribing, uh, you know, a lot of stuff in, in YouTube world that is kind of crazy. Uh, but you know, Mary is one strong woman. Summer needs to be found. 
and all of this mishigosh in terms of all of these lies, all of the stuff that we've um, uncovered are relevant to Summer's whereabouts and disappearance. So, Don, you need to knock it off. You need to stop it. And you need to recognize the world is looking for your daughter while you're complaining about people not looking for her daughter, for your daughter. Just need to stop. And you need to lay it out, whatever it is. Okay. The second piece of this is this Wednesday night, don't miss the, the next guest I'm going to come on. That's going to come on. Um, she's amazing. Her name is Josephine. And her sweet daughter was murdered. And the suspect is on the U.S. Marshal's most wanted list. And we're going to talk about her. And then um, you're going to see some pretty amazing things that I think we can correlate uh, to get even more energy into Summer's disappearance. Okay. So God bless everybody. Keep the faith. Keep moving forward. Don't look behind you. Okay. Um, I am, trust me, there's a lot more coming. And by the way, I have a total of 12 phone calls from Don Welsh. 12. Okay. And I've only played two. Okay. So he needs to knock it off. Okay. And you need to get on where your daughter is and not just talk about it. Okay. So we're thankful for everybody. Uh, are you guys ready to go to Hawaii? Uh, I'm ready to go to Hawaii tonight. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you again uh, for being here. And uh, so with that, let me see. Dylan, are you still out there? Yep. Let's go. Let's go to Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. See you Wednesday night. You're not going to want to miss it. Hard working every day I'm stressed out 24-7, babe 